physical of this court, draw nigh and shall be heard. God bless the United States, this state, and this court. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Colin. First case. In the matter of Alaya Estelle Prim. All right, I require everyone who is associated with this adoption to come up here. I want to get a, I want to get a good look at everybody that somehow They're connected us. That's all right. We have a big courtroom. That's all right. We won't require that of female, but. <laughs> Somewhere along the line is the person who's going to adopt. Right? <laughs> Smith, are you ready now? I am. And let's, uh, anyone who's going to testify in this matter, raise your right hand, let's place you on the road. Do solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth will help you God. Yes, I do. Would you state your name, please? Lacey Butita. And uh, is this your foster daughter right now? Yes. How long has she been in your home? About a year and a half. A year and a half. And y'all have gotten to know each other? Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand that adoption means that Alea will be yours like she was born to you? Yes. And that you'll have all the responsibilities that that entails, and along with the fun, times, and the joy. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? And this is what you want to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Alea, is this what you want? <laughs> <laughs> Thank your name, please. Hannah Breeze. And Ms. Breeze, where are you employed? At the Department of Children's Services. And the Department of Children's Services at Full Guardianship of Alaya? Yes, ma'am. And does the department want to relinquish that guardianship so she can be adopted? Yes, we do. <laughs> no more questions. Ms. Boutita, I've reviewed the file and I've reviewed the home study and everything, all the confidential reports and everything is in order. Um, there are a few things I get to do in this job that give me more pleasure than to grant an adoption. And one of the things I will tell you that based on my experience, both as a parent, as a step parent, and as a uh, judge now for many years, is that it takes more than biology to be a parent. It takes more than biology to create a family. And what it takes is the love and affection and opening up your home and your heart to someone that needs a home. And I admire you for doing that. Everything is in order. My only job is to make sure that you understand the significance of this. And that is, as Ms. Smith points out, this is a permanent relationship. Right now, you're a foster parent. When I actually grant this adoption, that changes. And she is forever your child, the same as if she was born to you in the eyes of the law. There's no difference. And she will be your daughter no matter what, no matter when she brings some hairy-legged boy back at 16. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stand him and, you, and she started arguing about how late she stays up at night. You can't bring her back to me and tell me that you've made a terrible mistake. So <clears throat> I raised a couple of uh, teenagers as, of my own. So in any event, you understand the significance of this, that she will become your child. She'll inherit, have the right to inherit from you and you from her and every other way. And you're assuming financial responsibility for her. And that financial responsibility, I can tell you, oftentimes exceeds the age of 18 years. So you understand that? <laughs> Just ask my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's in order, so I'm happy to grant your adoption.
Congratulations, it's a girl. <laughs> Well, I want everybody up there. <laughs> well, y'all come on up there. Come on, Mommy. Something tells me my day has just peaked. Yes. <laughs> it's all down to it. All right, call the next case. Stephanie Elaine Starbuck versus Jackie Don Starbuck Buck Sr. Is that Starbuck Buck or Starbuck? <clears throat> There's a, this is here on a citation for failure to comply with the court's requirement of a parenting class. That, an order will be entered to show that Jackie Starbuck has not complied with that order and that will be considered in the future if there are any litigation. Same thing for Daniel Baker. There's no evidence that he has complied with that uh, requirement of a parenting class of an order will be entered showing he is not in compliance. Jonathan William Clark versus Victoria Nicole Clark. All right, both of you raise your right hand. Let's place you under oath. You are Jonathan William Clark. Mr. Clark, you uh, filed a complaint for divorce using a, a form that the state provides online for individuals wishing to represent themselves that contains certain statistical information. Is that information true and correct? Yes. You've also filed with the court a marital dissolution agreement, also called a divorce agreement. Um, and you, again, using the form the state provides online that purports to bear your signature and that of your spouse. Is that your signature? Yes, sir. And do you believe that agreement fairly and equitably divides all of your property and distributes all of your debts? Is there anything between you and Ms. Clark that's not addressed in that? No. Uh, are you Victoria Nicole Clark? Yes. Clark, is that your signature that appears on the uh, marital dissolution agreement? Yes. Do you believe that agreement fairly and equitably divides all your property and distributes all of your debts? Yes, sir. 
Right. You have handed me a marital dissolution, I'm sorry, a final decree of divorce that both of you have filled out completely, which is a nice change because you followed the instructions and you both signed everywhere you're supposed to sign and filled in all the blanks. So I'd be glad. Now, are we changing your name? Right. It's changing it to Spicer, mm -hmm. Victoria Nicole Spicer. Yes. I have signed your final decree and granted your divorce. You can get a copy of that um, when you go to the clerk's office. But it'll take a little while for them to transport it from over there and then file and so forth. So if, you'll, if you need it this morning, first thing, you'll have to wait a little bit, okay? Clerk and master will have your copies. All right, thank you. Warren Rainey versus Good morning. <clears throat> Both of you raised your hand. Well, let me first of all instruct you on one thing. You have filed a complaint for divorce, and uh, you've also filed a parenting plan that uh, is required by state law as a part of your divorce decree <clears throat> or divorce proceedings. The problem is, is that you omitted a significant page. When I reviewed your documents, you skipped over page four, which has to do with the assessment of child support, and I cannot um, approve a divorce unless there's some provision made in your final decree regarding child support. The two of you, there's a state law that says I have to affirm that this is in the best interest of your child or children, and therefore it has to have something in there that addresses how you're handling the support of your child or children, because right now there's nothing mentioned about support whatsoever. So you're going to have to go back and reprint that, and then there's a child support calculator. I understand you're sharing equally the time. Uh, the law would say that you would either have to calculate that child support obligation according to the computerized uh, system that's available to you online where you've got this form, and you can then see what the child support obligation of either one of you would be. If you are going to agree that there be no child support exchange, that you support the child, you're going to have to show a reason why that is the case. That if your incomes are, are identical uh, or very similar and that you're both sharing all of the expenses, you're going to have to set that out in writing on your agreement for me to be able to afford to uh, approve it. I cannot approve it where there's no mention made of child support whatsoever. I'm not trying to be difficult, but that is the state law. So we want to make sure when you get this done, it's done validly and, and enforceably. And for that reason, you need to make sure that there's uh, that information is applied. As soon as you can submit a, a, a parenting plan that complies with the state law, then you can come back into court and get your hearing. So, okay. All right. Thank you. We'll just pass it on the docket until you can get that done. Versus Savage Development LLC. Good morning. This motion, you already have one motion to dismiss that Judge Lockhart Mash heard in this case. I'm sure you don't want to have Judge Lockhart Mash hear this one as well since she's familiar. Is your case? Um, I mean, I do think that would probably make sense, but I mean, we're here and ready. It's, it's up. It's up to the court if um, if you would prefer I that. that. I hear whatever is before me, unless there's some reason not to. So I'm just uh, suggesting, if either side wants Judge Lockhart Mash to hear it, uh, then we can reset it in front of Judge Lockhart Mash. Otherwise, if you want to proceed today, I'll hear it and I'll give it my best shot. But, the inconsistencies of having two judges hear it is the only thing I'm concerned about. So. I'm fine with proceeding. Um, when did when does she? Okay. Yeah. Let, let's just proceed this morning. All right. Um, and and so I'll, I'll give a little bit of background, Your Honor, since since um, I've read through the file. Okay. All right. So it, it's a very standard residential real estate transaction that, that we're talking about. But I do think that the claims that 
the plaintiffs uh, are asserting here, you know, have the potential, if if recognized by the court, to have a, a pretty big impact on, uh, you know, residential real estate transactions in in Tennessee. We understand the high burden that we've that we've got to meet to prevail on a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, but we would argue, Your Honor, that this is a textbook example of. Uh, of, of why the motion to dismiss mechanism exists. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the, the standard Tennessee residential purchase and sell agreement form that is probably being used on dozens of, of transactions here in, in this town today. Uh, that's That form uh, has the standard as is language that's really at issue and really the basis of, of our motion to dismiss. Uh, the contract documents, which were included as exhibits to the plaintiff's complaint, could not be more clear that the plaintiffs purchased the property as is. Um, so we're simply asking the court in our motion to enforce that language that exists in the standard form in these transactions. The, the specific terms uh, of the purchase sell agreement that I think are important and that I will draw the court's attention to um, and, and the purchase and sell agreement is exhibit A to the plaintiff's complaint. Section 7B says the buyer who, who are the plaintiffs shall have the right and responsibility to make inspections and specifically list the, the various items that, that they're required to inspect. Plaintiffs then had this inspection performed and this is all alleged in their complaint, which I, I recognize we're confined to what's in the complaint, but these are their allegations. By choice home inspections, that was their inspector. I think it's important to know they were previously a defendant in this case. They settled with them and they are no longer a party. Uh, so after that inspection, the, the form contemplates a repair, it's called a repair and replace amendment, which standard form lists all the items that the inspection revealed, hey, we're gonna fix these. That's a contract documents, exhibit C to the complaint. And in that document, it says the buyer has the right to inspect to confirm the items listed in the amendment have been completed. So do an inspection. Here's the issues. Have an amendment. We sign this provision that says you have another inspection that you have that you have to perform to make sure that all the repairs were completed. Their inspector, the prior defendant, inspected the property to ensure the repairs had been completed. Section eight, paragraph eight of the purchase sale agreement says buyer shall have the right to conduct a final inspection. And then the critical language in section eight of the purchase and sell agreement, closing of this sale constitutes acceptance of the property in its condition as of the time of closing, less otherwise noted in writing. With that, parties close and they get the property as is. There's another contract document that's also an exhibit to the complaint standard form. It's in all these transactions, the residential property condition exemption. And it states, seller advises that no representations or warranties express or implied as the condition as to the condition of the property and its improvements are being offered by the seller. These were signed, property closes, they've got the property as is. But so now let, let's so that, that's that's the deal. That, that's what the deal was, the standard form. Uh, otherwise, the what is the, the as is language means nothing. The three inspections that they were required to perform and in, and in fact did perform would mean nothing. So what's what's their argument in their response? <clears throat> they say the as is all the everything that we just walked through, their inspections that they had to perform and did inform or did perform and the as is language should be ignored because of fraud. Of course, well aware you've got to plead fraud with particularity and specificity. We'll get into that in a second, but the amendment complaint certainly hasn't done that. But in their opposition, in their brief, in response to our motion, their argument is, well, our complaint alleges that we concealed and misrepresented numerous known problems and deficiencies. That's their fraud with specificity argument. Well, let's go to, and, and, and in their response, they cite to, pay to, to paragraphs 34 through 40 of their complaint. But you look at those allegations and it's, we see exactly what happened. They had subsequent inspections done after closing 
And based on those inspections, which they had some before, and they, they were required to be done before closing and after closing, they, they took the property at their own peril. But based on those inspections after closing, they're contending, well, there were other issues that we didn't know about. And, that, and your repairs that we asked you to perform and that we did perform weren't adequate. So let, the, the various problems with that argument, Your Honor, their failure to disclose fraud claim or, or fraud argument, there could be no failure to disclose when it was their responsibility to perform the inspections. That's, that's the first issue. The second issue, the contract, we expressly said we make no representations or warranties as to the condition of the property. We're telling you that. So how, how can that be fraud for failing to disclose when we say we're not making any representations? It's on you to make the inspections, which they did. And apparently their inspections weren't sufficient because they sued their inspector for negligence and then settled with them. The very purpose of the inspections and in the repair and replace amendment says, hey, you've got to go do another inspections to make sure that the repairs that you ask us to do are sufficient. And we did that. And they said, yeah, we're closing. We take the property as is. The contract set out a very, very clear process for the inspections, for the repairs, and then closing after which they get the property as is. And essentially their lawsuit, Your Honor, is asking for more repairs after all that. That obviously wasn't the deal. I, I would direct, we, we've cited various cases in our, in our brief, and I'm obviously not going to go through all of them, but you know, some of, some of them are, are very um, sort of almost identical facts to this one. So the, the one that I would direct the court to is the uh, F.C. Cox construction case. It's a Western District of Tennessee case. And I'll just read from um, a portion of it that, that really kind of highlights or, or parallels kind of what's going on here. And in that case, dealing with same, same as his language, court is holding. Case law makes clear that as is clause in a contract for sale or lease of property prohibits the buyer from bringing a claim under the sale contract for defects in the property. In essence, Tennessee courts hold that an as is clause charges the buyer of property with knowledge of any defects and prohibits the buyer or lessee from bringing a contract claim against the seller or lessor. I mean, that's exactly what we have here. But it, it, and in their response, and I imagine what they're going to argue this morning, well, we, 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 we alleged failure to disclose. We, we, you know, we, we pled fraud, so that's enough to get over a motion to dismiss. Your Honor, the Tennessee law is very clear that the court is not required to accept as true assertions that are merely legal arguments or legal conclusions couched as facts. In other words, They've got to plead facts that constitute fraud. They've not done that. And I, I was trying to, you know, I'm, I'm an analogies person. That helps me understand some of these concepts. And so I was thinking, well, what's an analogy that would make sense? But this, a plaintiff alleges fraud, or excuse me, alleges theft. That, that's a claim, right? Hey, they, they stole from me. But the pleadings demonstrate that, that the defendant is actually the rightful owner of, of the property. The court doesn't have to accept the allegation of, of theft if the facts actually demonstrate that they, they were the rightful owner of the property. So here, based on everything we just went through, based on it with their obligation to inspect, we specifically disclaimed any conditions of the property. And the as is language to wrap it all up, they can say fraud, but those facts or those allegations don't amount to fraud. The purchase and sell agreement, Your Honor, we would say have to have to mean something. The, the provisions in there have to mean something. And if we're going to entertain basically a third or fourth bite at the apple saying, hey, we need more repairs, it effectively guts the purchase and sell agreement that is the basis of 
the vast majority of all residential real estate transactions in, in Tennessee. The, so that's, that's the breach of contract claim. We don't, the, the basis of our motion, Your Honor, is they, have a, they cannot allege facts that would amount to a breach, to non-performance because of the clear language in the contract. The second claim that they've got, Your Honor, is, is under the Tennessee Consumer Protection Act. And quite simply, this is not a Tennessee Consumer Protection Act case. The, the same basis for their fraud argument is one of the bases of their Tennessee Consumer Protection Act claim of, well, you misrepresented the condition of the property. You failed to disclose. For everything that we just walked through, Your Honor, that can't be. We can't mis misrepresent something when we tell you we're not representing anything. We can't, if the, if the onus is on the buyers to perform their inspections and determine the issues with the property, that, that's not on us. The, uh, another argument or another reason that the, the TCPA claim fails, Your Honor, is we're talking about real property here. That, that the whole basis of their, of their claim is this, this real property wasn't what you told us it was. Put aside what we just went through of, of we didn't tell you it was anything. Um, the case law is very clear that real property is not a good or a service, which is what one of the one of their prongs of the TCPA that they're that they're trying to prevail under. It, it doesn't apply to real property. We we cited the Overton case, which they've ignored in in their in the response that makes it very clear that real property is not a good or service. So they're saying we misrepresented the property. That's not a good, it's not a service. Now they're gonna say, well, you, you, you perform some repairs as part of this uh, transaction. So th those are services. We never held ourselves out as offering services. We were selling them a house and they asked us to perform repairs. We didn't perform the repairs, we procured them. But this, this is not a TCPA case. They've not cited to a single case, and we've not found one. I mean, of the thousands and thousands of, of, of residential transactions where folks say, hey, there's defects in this property, I've not found one, and they've not cited one, where that rose to the level of a TCPA claim, where somebody's, where construction defects constitute a Tennessee Consumer Protection Act claim. They've not cited that, and, and I've not found that. So that leaves us with their final argument under the TCPA claim that, well, we should have had a contractor's license. There's a, there's a section of the TCPA, one of the 40 prongs or whatever it is, is that if you hold yourself out as a, as a contractor, uh, as having a license, or you a, and I'll, it's a the definition of contracting attempt to and I'm quoting here or submit a price or bid or offers to construct supervise superintend oversee construction where the total cost of the construction is twenty five thousand over twenty five thousand. There's no allegation in the complaint that we represented we were licensed. We weren't licensed. We were selling them a house. The only thing we did, Your Honor, was go hire third parties to perform the repairs that they ask us to perform. We, we weren't holding ourselves out saying, hey, I'll go do some construction for you. We were selling them a house. So uh, to, to say that we're holding, our, we're holding ourselves out as a contractor, that, that wasn't the transaction here. We're, we're selling a house to them. Uh, there's also no allegations in the complaint, Your Honor, that the repairs that we procured exceeded $25,000, which that's the threshold that you would ever need a contractor's license. You know, in their response, they talk about, well, the repairs that they said they end up having to perform on their own exceeded $25,000, but that's not the, that's not the litmus test. The litmus test would be the repairs that we were performing. There's no allegations in the complaint that talk about the value of the repairs that they ask us to perform. Um, and finally, Your Honor, same same issue there no no case law support at all in their in their opposition 
that stands for the notion of somebody selling a house like this has to have a contractor's license to go procure repairs that they ask for as part of the deal. Um, I think the implications of what they're arguing, this kind of gets to my earlier statement about, you know, how this could, you know, if, if what they're saying is, is the law, which I don't believe it is, and I don't think the law says that it is, but every residential real estate transaction where the, you know, is an owner going to be converted to a, a contractor requiring a license to go perform the, you know, punch list items that gets revealed in an inspection. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, and then finally, uh, they've got claims against individually Miss Brandy Casillas, who is the CEO of Savage Development, who is the, the, the entity that owned the property, that sold the property that we're talking about here. All of the sale documents that we've talked about this morning are signed by Ms. Casillas, and after every signature, it says CEO of Savage Development. There's not a single allegation in the complaint that, that would support a claim of, against her individually in her personal capacity. Uh, you know, their opposition brief, I would, I would argue, is pretty telling that in response to our, our motion, there's, I think, three sentences that says, well, we we define defendants as everybody. So all of our allegations are, are aimed at, at her individually as well. And so, you know, I, I would argue that even under a liberal pleading standard, which we all know we're operating under here, but you've got to provide enough factual allegations to put somebody on notice, to put Ms. Casillas on notice of what did she do in her individual capacity to state a claim for under the TCPA. I don't think their amended or the amended complaint does that. I don't think there's really anything directed at her um, because she didn't do anything in her individual capacity. And I don't think there's any allegations uh, that support that. So in, in, in closing, Your Honor, we, we think the, the amended complaint, all the claims against uh, Savage Development and, and Ms. Casillas should be dismissed uh, for, for fair to state a claim for the reasons that we uh, went through in detail in our brief and, and covered here this morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Good. We should clarify if it's not clear from the pleadings, there is an additional defendant. Eric Casillas, who is pro se, who's not here today. Um, this is an action that arises out of the numerous intentional and knowing failures, concealments, and fraudulent misrepresentations by the defendants. The property was fully renovated at the time of contracting, and that critical repairs were then completed. Representations that induced the plaintiffs to enter into a contract and to purchase, purchase a property that instead was fraught with defects and poor workmanship, the extent of which only became apparent upon completion of the sale much later. Defense, defendants are attempting to shield themselves from all liability in contradiction to the plain language of the relevant statutes and applicable state case law. These efforts must fail the Tennessee consumers like my clients, must be protected, and the defendant's motion to dismiss should be accordingly denied. Our amended complaint uh, satisfies the requirements of Rule 8 for a short, plain statement of the facts, and Rule 12, uh, our facts are sufficiently pled to establish each of our claims. Uh, I'd like to take a little bit of time detailing our breach of contract claims and the very specific facts that support that and uh, the related fraud claims uh, that will also impact our arguments on the Tennessee uh, Consumer Protections Act. To make out a valid claim for breach of contract, we have to show an enforceable contract, non-performance amounting to breach, and damages caused by the breach of contract. Our amended complaint sufficiently alleges all those facts. Paragraph 61, we have a contract that it, 
that is valid and binding between the parties, paragraph 62. Defendant Sauvage, uh, in the amendment, is promising to complete the described repairs within three days. Paragraph 63, defendants have breached that amendment by failing to make all the repairs and replacements. Looking to Carter v. Kruger, this was a case by the Tennessee Court of Appeals. An act or omission rising to the level of breach of contract can include the failure of the defendant to perform at the appropriate standard of workmanship. That was a failure we see throughout the case in the work that we allege was performed by Sauvage. Is that Sauvage? If we look to uh, Exhibit C of the amended complaint, it notes uh, the repair work to be performed on the chimney. And yet, in the Exhibit E to the amended complaint, we have uh, an engineer's report noting numerous instances of deficiency in workmanship. That both chimneys showed mortar cracks and brick cracks, and the left chimney displayed loss of mortar in the mortar joints. This occurring. Um, after the sale was completed. Turning back to Exhibit C, uh, the repair and replace amendment. This notes uh, the defendant's obligation to provide repair work to the HVAC unit. And this was these issues were what were, uh, were caused so much uh, damage to the house after the sale was completed. I think it's important to note in line 28 of that repair and replace agreement. All other terms and conditions of the aforementioned agreement shall remain in full force and effect. And that's important because when we look to that agreement, line 263, the seller shall cause all utility services to be operational so that the buyer may complete all inspections and tests under this agreement. And yet, looking to the complaint, paragraph 17, we can say, we can see that the defendants failed this obligation. HVAC power connection, was not even hooked up and there was no coolant in the system. HVAC was also not hooked up to power upstairs. It was the messiest job of duct work he has ever seen. And this again is repair work that we have specifically alleged was performed by defendants and defendant salvage. As a direct result of defendant's breach of contract here, you see the plaintiffs have suffered significant damage at least $45,000. That's shown in, that's alleged in paragraph 64. And again, in paragraph 22 and thereafter, we start to see the problems that occurred because the defendants failed to hook up that power, which would have allowed them to perform the inspections uh, under the repair and replace amendment. Paragraph 22, plants heard dripping sounds coming from upstairs. Paragraph 23, water was leaking from underneath both upstairs door frames and into the ceiling in the foyer downstairs. It was leaking out of the can lights. Paragraph 24 uh, relates to the discovery that the HVAC pan in the attic was overflowing and that defendants Eric Casillas and Savage installed the HVAC unit on unlevel ground and the emergency switch to shut off the unit uh, in the event of a leak had failed. Again, we're saying that Savage performed these uh, repairs and replacements. They're the ones who listed the property and described it as fully renovated at the time <laughs> of contracting. As opposing counsel mentioned, Brandy Casillas is the CEO. <laughs> I think it's clear from our complaint that we're treating these three parties together as the defendants because they together were performing these repairs. It appears though that everything that Ms. Casillas did was in a representative capacity from what I reviewed this morning very briefly the file and also what counsel for the defense has said that if that is the case, how could she be liable for anything if uh, everything is done in a representative capacity? In other words, we don't sue individual members of a, of a corporate entity. The corporate entity is liable, not the individual person. So how would she be liable, even given your facts, that she was the CEO of the company and she directed the 
renovations that you complain of, how would that be uh, something that could make her personally liable? I think that's a fair point. And um, I think really, realistically, the only way that she would be personally liable is through a piercing of the corporate veil. And there's no allegations made in your complaint about piercing the corporate veil. I just that's wanted true. to make sure if there was something I was missing. So, all right, no, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Um, now, opposing counsel says this breach of contract uh, cannot be because the parties signed a sales agreement with as-is provisions, and we agree. Um, Chadwick v. Spence, uh, in that case, it stands for the proposition that as-is clauses are valid and enforceable in the absence of fraud, uh, fraudulent misrepresentation and concealment. And I want to take some time to go through exactly how we, in, our, in the facts of our amended complaint, have sufficiently pled each of the elements of fraud. Um, first, plaintiffs have alleged that defendants were directly involved in performing the work. Paragraph 8, defendants so have purchased the property to renovate. Paragraph 53, they undertook and performed the construction on the property. Paragraph 36, substandard renovation work was completed by defendants. Paragraph 24, Sovage installed the HVAC unit on the ground level. Uh, paragraph 34, the siding that defendants added to the sides of the chimney had no function except to conceal the otherwise apparent defects in the chimney. Plants have also alleged that Having undertaken these substandard renovation and repairs, the defendants misrepresented and concealed the defects and failures of their own work. Paragraph 54, defendants concealed and misrepresented the condition of the property by listing as fully renovated. Paragraph 34, the siding defendants added to the chimney concealed apparent defects. Paragraph 34, defendants were aware, misrepresented, and concealed uh, these defects from the plaintiffs. Plaintiffs further alleged that the defendants knew of the falsity of these misrepresentations and did so knowingly, uh, and the defendants knew precisely what defects they were concealing. Paragraph 36 relates to substandard renovation work uh, of which defendants were aware. Paragraph 37 references defective windows that defendants knowingly failed to disclose. Again, paragraph 38 references HVAC work uh, that defendants failed to disclose. Paragraph 40 references the chimney defects that defendants knowingly concealed and failed to disclose. Plaintiffs also alleged that these misrepresentations were material. In paragraphs 42 and 55, they relate essentially the same thing, that but for defendants' failure to fully disclose all material defects, defendants and the concealments by defendants, as the property being fully renovated, plaintiffs would not have purchased the property from the defendants. And lastly, plaintiffs have alleged damages, paragraph 57, $45,000. Now, defendants have suggested that they get to escape liability in light of any negligence by 30 party inspectors. They cite no legal authority to support that contention. It's well settled in Tennessee that the negligence of one party does not absolve liability of another party for their own wrongful conduct. Um, and so here, regardless of any negligence by home choice inspectors or other inspectors, defendants' fraudulent misrepresentations and concealments render the as-is provisions of the agreement un invalid and unenforceable. Turning to our claims uh, under the TCPA, To make out a valid claim for a violation of the TCPA, a plaintiff must show that the defendant engaged in an unfair or deceptive act or practice declared unlawful by the TCPA and that the defendant's conduct uh, resulted in damages. As we've already shown, the plaintiff has sufficiently alleged that defendants made knowing and willful fraudulent misrepresentations, not simply about the property itself, but about their services that they directly provided to repair and restore the property, and that these deceptive practices caused an ascertainable loss of money or property. I want to point out that opposing counsel states that those 
um, services were procured. That's not what we've alleged. Those are not facts alleged in the complaint. We're alleging that defendants in Sauvage were directly responsible and performed that work. And so our allegations regarding defendants' actions fall, square, fall squarely within several categories. Again, services under Section 103, Subsection 23, refers to any work, labor, or services, including services furnished in connection with the sale or repair of real property or improvements there, too. These are the services we're referencing. So they violated Section 104, Subsection 7, representing that services of a particular quality or grade if they are of another. Subsection 104.9, advertising goods or services with intent not to sell them as advertised. Again, that goes back to listing the property as fully renovated when it clearly was not. Using statements or illustrations in any advertisement to create a false impression of the quality of those services. And again, defendants concealed and misrepresented the condition of their property as being fully renovated. So defendants are arguing that this claim must fail because our claims have to do with the real property itself and not the services. But defendants chose to operate a business in which they are the owners and sellers and the renovators and the re repair construction service providers all in one. Thus, in this case, defendant's sale of the property was part and parcel with the provision of defendant's services and misrepresentations about the condition of the real property or likewise misrepresentations about the services that they provided or failed to provide. Defendants also argue that the TCPA must be inapplicable here because there is a separate statute uh, that more specifically addresses residential property representations and disclosures. That's the Disclosure Act opposing counsel discussed. We respectfully disagree with that. Uh, we, we assert that the Disclosure Act and the TCPA are complementary statutes. The Disclosure Act provides a more specialized framework for residential property disclosures, but even the categories of deceptive practices in the TCPA can still be relevant. And Tennessee courts uh, unquestionably continue to apply the TCPA to residential To make that point, under the Non-Disclosure Act, Section 208A3, purchaser's remedies of an owner's misrepresentations on a residential disclosure statement may include other such remedies at law or, or equity otherwise available against an owner in the event of an owner's intentional or willful misrepresentation of the condition of the property. That's exactly what we're doing here. They claim they're exempt from that statute because they didn't live in the property. And the argument we're making is that even if they're exempt from providing those type of warranties, there's a difference between that and making an intentional fraudulent misrepresentation that the property you're getting is fully renovated and that uh, you've completed uh, specific repairs. Um, to make that point, uh, Opposing counsel relies on a case, the Hogue case in their complaint, they attached that. I wanted to kind of go over some very specific uh, differences between that case and ours. In Hogue, there's, there are no affirmative statements about the condition of the property or the quality of the renovation services or about any concealments. None of that was, was included in the facts of the case. Um, there were simply some water intrusions that were caused by nearby storm drains. Uh, not the defendant's own renovations, not their own concealments. Um, the exemption notice uh, at the heart of opposing counsel's case, as I see it, isn't the equivalent of an as-is provision. And, uh, they're not required to make representations or warranties, but that should not uh, mean that they get to shield themselves from affirmative fraudulent misrepresentations that they know uh, are false at the time of making them and induced buyers into contracting. In the Hope case, uh, the repair, the contracts 
include this language. Seller has satisfied all the re repair requests as agreed in the repair amendment. House is sold as is. That's different than in this case where we're arguing that they did not provide all the repairs being requested. That language is not in the contract. And here where the defendant is making affirmative false misrepresentations about the, the condition of the property and about their services, um, this type of as is clause should not be able to apply uh, to allow them to shield themselves from their own misconduct. We've also alleged that defendants have violated the TCPA by acting in the capacity of a licensed contractor. Just looking at the plain meaning of the statute, section 102.4a1, a contractor includes any person or entity that offers to construct or assume charge of the construction, alteration, repair, improvement, or furnishing of labor for a building. These are precisely the facts that we've alleged in this case. We think Savage uh, fits the description. Um, paragraphs 8 and 53 indicate the defendants are a business which fits squarely within this definition of a contractor. Um, paragraph 8, the defendants offer of construction, repair, and improvement services were explicitly incorporated into the purchase and sale agreement. That's in lines 305 to 311 of the agreement and lines 6 to 21 of the amendment. Um, additionally, the the repair and improvements represented that were required following the defendant's misrepresentations uh, amounted to at least $25,000 in damages. And so I think we've met essentially the definition of that violation under 104B35. Um, again, we're stating that they act in the capacity of a licensed contractor to represent, and, and in that meaning, they've represented through their words and their conduct, taking on the role as a contractor that they were as such. Uh, the defendants have falsely held themselves out as such by expressly, both expressly and by the nature of their services. As a company in the business of construction, repair, renovation, and resale of property. And so I, it would not, it would only apply to businesses that choose to package construction, repair, and renovation services with consumer home sales, rather than the more typical approach noted by defendants where the owner is procuring repairs requested by the buyer. Um, defendant has indicated that that's not the case, but these are not the facts that we've alleged. Um, and so for the foregoing reasons, the court should deny the plaintiff's motion to dismiss in its entirety. Uh, we've sufficiently alleged a breach of contract, the, the unenforceability of the as-is provisions due to their, our, plan, our plaintiff's material reliance on the fraudulent misrepresentations, concealments. We've sufficiently alleged facts supporting the violations of the TCPA. Uh, and given the considerable factual disputes at the heart of this case, we would urge that the defendant's motion to dismiss is premature. So we're asking the court to dismiss that motion. Thank you. Two minutes, Your Honor, rebuttal. Go ahead. So I'll be quick. I would just direct the court um, to the Chadwick case, we cited it in our in our brief. Opposing counsel this morning has has referenced it. Very similar facts, and and what I what I think is most important is there's a fraudulent misrepresentation argument that the plaintiffs are making in that case to try and get around the as is language, just like plaintiffs are here this morning and in their brief, and in the holding and. 
rejecting the breach of contract claim and the plaintiff's argument of fraudulent misrepresentation to try and get around the as-is language in that case. Same residential form. <clears throat> plaintiff's argument is grounded upon the theory that defendant's alleged failure to disclose the existing damage to the property somehow violates the contract of sale. This theory necessarily implies that the contract contains some guarantee regarding the condition of the property at the time of the sale. The plain language of the contract, however, does not contain any such provision. To the contrary, the contract states that the property shall be conveyed as is with no warranty whatsoever as to the property condition. It's exactly what we have here. Because of the as is clause, the risk of loss occasioned by virtue of condition of the property is shifted to the plaintiffs whose claim for breach of contract must fail. Could not be more on point, Your Honor. So I know we're in a motion to dismiss uh, procedural posture. We recognize that burden, but our client should not have to spend tens of thousands of dollars going through discovery, going through a, a summary judgment motion, God forbid, a trial, when we've got the clear contract that the parties negotiated and signed that contains the as-is language and the inspection requirements that the plaintiffs had. We would ask that you grant our motion. Well, I don't like taking things under advisement. And I have several that I've had to do that lately, and this will be one added to the list. I don't have to give you a written opinion after I have been able to review all of the documents and all of the exhibits and everything. So I'll give you a written opinion as quickly as I can. Thank you, Your Honor. We're going to stand in recess for 15 minutes. All rise.
Danielle Elizabeth Bowdoin versus Clint Matthew Bowdoin. Your Honor, I'm ready on mine. Danielle Elizabeth Bodine versus Clint okay. Matthew Bodine. Oh, Your Honor, this is one of my private cases from before I went to the DA's office. I just simply said I didn't think it was a criminal case in the <laughs> Chancery docket. Yes, Your Honor, I'm, and Ms. Hillary Duke represented the wife in this matter, but she has withdrawn. I believe it's for lack of communication. So I had filed a notice of final hearing, and I sent it to her last known address that I got from Ms. Duke in Lyles, Tennessee. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bowden, can you state your full name for this court, please? Clint Matthew Bowden. And Mr. Bowden, where do you currently reside? Well, let's make sure that microphone's on a little bit. Working. Is it on? Okay. Now we got it. Where do you currently reside? I, I live in Hickman County at 10035 Carlos Cove in Lyles. Okay. And you're currently married to Miss Danielle Bowden, correct? Yes. Okay. And do you recall when y'all got married? Uh, 2011. Okay. Do you recall when you separated? 2013. And you've been separated since then, correct? Yes. And Miss Bowden had lived in Dixon County when this divorce was filed, is that correct? Um, or close to Dixon County? In Hickman County still, and then she moved to Dixon right afterwards. Okay. And so we've accepted Dixon County as having jurisdiction. And we're yeah, she's been there the whole time, yeah. Okay. And do you and Miss Bowden have children together? Yes. And what are their names? The oldest is Chloe and the youngest is Claire. Okay. What are their ages? 17 and 13. Okay. And did you and Miss Bowden have a sort of informal custody arrangement or visitation schedule? Yes. Um, before we even went to court, we had this thing drew up and she signed it, I signed it, and pretty much saying that I would have the kids since she didn't have nowhere to go and stuff. And, and then finally we did go to court with the child support stuff. Okay, and child support, just for the record, is being paid through the Child Support Office of Hickman County, Tennessee, correct. is that correct. correct? Yes, correct. And that's still the case today? Yes. Okay. Who's paying child support? Miss Bowden pays child support to you. She's then. supposed to, yes. Okay. She hasn't been paying, but no. she... No. Okay. How much is she supposed to be paying you per week? Uh, I only ask for like a hundred, I mean, 120 bucks a week for both kids, mm -hmm. and I'm not getting that at all, but um, they, they wanted me to ask her for like 250 a week, but I didn't want to do all that, so I tried to make it easier on her, so 120 a week. Okay, but you hadn't been getting kids. that? No. Okay. Do you recall when the last time you got a child support payment oh, was? It's been over a year ago. Okay. And as far as custody of those children, mm -hmm. your request to the judge today is that you have custody uh, yes. and continue to have custody, and you're also asking the court make sure I'm understanding correctly, for visitation with Miss Bowden to be at your discretion. Yes, uh, that would be great. Yeah. And why is that what you want? Just so I know where, the, where she's taking them, you know, or if, what condition she's in, stuff like that. Does Miss Bowden have a drug problem? Yes. Did she recently go to rehab? Yes, she did. And then she left that rehab after four days? Yeah. Do you recall where that rehab was? It was in Columbia. Okay. Does Miss Bowden change addresses quite often? Oh, yes. Okay. That's why I can never keep up with her. Okay. Um, and you don't have a current address besides the last known address that we have for her, is that right? Right, yeah. Do you have any general idea where she might be? She's in Lebanon right now. Okay. But you don't but she did not provide you with an address. No. Okay. No. But I do know for a fact she's there with mm -hmm. her friend. Okay. And moving to the property and assets mm -hmm. that you two have, do you and Miss Bowden own any real property together? No. And do you own real property that you purchased after the separation? Yes. Where is that at? It's in Bonacqua. I mean, Lyles. It's at address 10035. Okay. Oh, let's go. And you bought that in within the last couple of years, is that Yes, ma'am. Uh, not even two years ago, I don't think. But and yeah. you would be asking the court to award you that property as your own separate property, correct? Yes, ma'am. And I did have Danielle sign off on paperwork saying that she couldn't fight me for it and stuff like that. With the real estate agency? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, as far as personal property, have you and Miss Bowden already divided all of your personal assets? Oh yeah, a long time ago. Okay. 
So you're not making any requests for anything that she might have in her possession today? No. no. As far as debt division, do you and Ms. Bowden have any joint debt? No. Okay. And you have your own debt that you would keep and you would request the court to have her responsible for any debt that she may have. Yeah, her she has, yeah. Okay. But you have no joint debt that you're aware of? No, ma'am. Okay. No. And moving to the last thing, the grounds for divorce. Yes. And your counter complaint, you stated that Ms. Bowden was guilty of adultery and inappropriate marital conduct. Can right. you tell the court briefly what that was in regard to? Yes, um, I just was at the house one morning and she came home early and I just, it, there was evidence that she was out and she admitted it to me. And so after that, we just separated after that, you know, she left the kids with me and we didn't see her for a few months and then she showed back up and off and on. That's how it's been ever since. Okay. So you're asking the court to grant you a divorce from Ms. Bowden today? Yes. Yes. And see, I, I, I mean, I would love to have the divorce and but the custody thing, you know, I, I think I should keep my kids, you know, I mean. And that's what we're asking the court for today. Yes. But we're asking the court to grant you a divorce on the grounds of adultery oh, please, yes, and yes. irreconcilable differences. Yes. Okay. So I don't believe I have any other questions. One or the other, but not both. <clears throat> We'll go with adultery, Your Honor. <laughs> Anything further? No, Your Honor, not from me. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. You may step down. Thank you. Do you have any other proof? No, Your Honor. Well, the uh, plaintiff, the original plaintiff having failed to appear and on having been given notice, then the defendant counter plaintiff, Mr. Bodine, is granted an absolute divorce on the grounds of inappropriate marital conduct or adultery. <clears throat> They're basically interchangeable, but uh, whichever one he actually stood for, it, inappropriate marital conduct is what he alleges in his complaint, I believe. Let me look. Both of them, Your Honor. Okay. But I can put inappropriate marital conduct. All right. Inappropriate marital conduct is what I see in the answer to complaint and counter complaint, but. Yes, Your Honor. Use that, and he did allege adultery as well. So you choose whichever one you want. He's proven both grounds. He is uh, awarded all real property that is in his name that he acquired separately from her. She's divested of any interest in that real property. He owns um, that separately and apart. He's awarded all personal property in his possession. She's awarded anything in her possession. Uh, each of them will be required to pay their own separate debts. Um, there was no proposed parenting plan filed as required by the statute by either the plaintiff or the counter plaintiff in this case. So I have not seen a proposed parenting plan <clears throat> that uh, either of you have proposed, but the parenting plan needs to be drafted. He will be designated as a primary residential parent for both the minor children. Um, her residential time will be uh, supervised or at his discretion, I guess would be the best way to do it. And at this point, she's not awarded any kind of overnight visitation with the children unless he approves of that. Child support is under the discretion of the uh, Child Support Collection Agency and the Child Support Magistrate in Hickman County, so we'll leave it at that. And that would be the uh, judgment of the court then. Thank you, Judge. I'll draw those orders. Right, thank you. Understanding you've had an agreed order that was entered back in January in front of Judge Lockett Nash in this case and operating under that, but under that order it was set for a hearing on the adoption of a parenting plan for today. <clears throat> the difficulty I have is that I am required to leave today at noon. I will not be available this afternoon, so whatever we can accomplish today, I'm happy to let you accomplish, but if we're not able to finish it, it's going to have to be rolled Day, so. Yes, Your Honor. What we've got is I represent Mrs. Hernandez, who is the respondent in this matter. Uh, Mr. Stelzi filed the complaint for divorce, but we filed the motion to adopt a temporary parenting plan. So we're here on my motion to adopt a parenting plan. We were here previously on January 30th of 2024. Um, and actually, I think it was a couple of days before the hearing, I, we discovered uh, counsel 
advised me on the day of the hearing that her client had been notified by his employer that he had to go out of the country the and, Guam. and he was going to be out of the country for approximately a month and so we entered into a temporary order on that time there wasn't a hearing we just simply said he got to see the child before he left and then he came back into town and he's had a visitation with the child when he came back into town and so we just rolled the motion in so i wanted to clarify there was a it was kind of a stopgap band-aid scenario that we put on here when we were here in january and so what we're here on today your honor is my motion to adopt a parenting plan testimony that's going to be before the court is the mother's been the primary residential parent the parties uh, began a relationship together and became pregnant prior to their marriage their child caden who is approximately 18 months old was born on september 9th of 2022 um, the parties then subsequently married uh, in july of 2023 so it's a very short-term marriage at the time, it's my understanding that Mr. Stealthy, uh, through his employer, did not work in the state of Tennessee. He worked, and there was an intention that the parties were going to relocate to his time. He then got transferred. I um, mean, is now in the state of Alabama working, um, and so the child has lived primarily with the mother in the mother's home that she owned prior to the marriage. The mother has other children. She's done the day-to-day -day parenting of the child, taking care of all of the all of the day-to-day -day needs of their son um, and that and that what we're asking your honor is just to establish on a temporary basis a residential schedule she lives here in dixon county he lives uh, i believe somewhere close to huntsville alabama um, and so we are asking that he be afforded every other weekend residential time that they meet at the exit at spring hill to exchange the child and he has from friday at six until sunday at six um, given the fact that we will probably not get into court before, even though it is a short-term marriage and there shouldn't be any property division to speak of, <clears throat> and it will just be the issue of the custody that we will be arguing, you know, that each party would get two non-interrupted we uh, two non-consecutive weeks in the summer to exercise residential time. It's an 18 month old child, Your Honor, um, who has siblings and has lived here prom exclusively with the mother. And the mother has been the exclusive caregiver for, for the lion's share of this child's life. And we're just simply asking uh, that that the father do does get some type of residential time, but it's on an alternating weekend basis. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we would call for the rule if there's anybody else that's going to testify. Mm -hmm. He's rule has been requested. If there are any witnesses other than the parties, they must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until they're called to testify. They're not to discuss testimony of any other party with anyone until they have themselves have testified. Is the monitor on outside? I don't, we don't have anybody, and I just knew this gentleman sitting here. I don't know. Yeah. There's, he's there's not no testifying. Else, no, he's not. Yeah. Thank All right. you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My name is Haley Parmenter. I represent Mr. Stelsey. We're here asking for Mr. Stelsey, or the parties to have week on, week off time. Uh, Mr. Stelsey had to move out of the marital home in October, and since then he's had about six hours of parenting time with his son. Um, he did move to Alabama. He's about an hour and a half away. That's where his employer is, but he's happy to meet halfway, drive all the way. The reason we're asking for this week on, week off is to maximize the, each parent's time with the child at this point. The child is 18 months, not quite in school yet, so it's an important time um, to have this schedule. There's no, like I said, there's no school. It's an easy way to do it. Mr. Celsi has um, a second bedroom. He has a daycare picked out, a doctor picked out if need be uh, while he has the child. Um, he's a capable father. He has a daughter from a prior relationship he's helped raise, um, so he's comfortable taking care of the child alone. He has the resources and he's willing to do it. Um, the week on week off cuts down on travel for both the child and the parties. And um, he wants to repair the bond that he's lost over the last few months, last six months with his son. A total of six hours of visitation, that's about it. Um, and there's no way to get, you know, he's he won a visitation before this, but there was just no way to get any with with mother not agreeing to any, he's been trying. So uh, this has been really tough on him, and he just wants to maximize the time with his son while he can. Thank you. 
Thank you. Robert, you may call your client. Yeah, I'll call of Ed Hernandez. Mr. Hernandez, go up and you'll sit right over. Which one? Absolutely. You're, really you're over all there. Okay. Your name for me, please, ma'am. Yvette Hernandez. And Ms. Hernandez, where do you reside? I live at 208 Luther Court in Dixon. And who owns that home? I own it. And how long have you lived there? I bought the house May of 2021. Okay. And who lives there with you? Um, it's me, Madeline, which is my oldest, Ronan, uh, Laylin, and Kai, Kaiden. Okay. So you have how many children? I have four total. Four children, three children with a previous relationship, is that correct? That's correct. And you have custody of, of those children, is yes. that correct? And, when, and who is their father? Uh, who's their father? Uh -huh. Thomas Myers. And Mr. Myers has residential time with the children when? Uh, every other weekend. Okay. And where does he live? He lives in Ridgetop. Okay. He has, he's, mo he's moved from this area and is living in uh, Robertson County now, is that correct? And he visits with those children on an alternating weekend. What are their ages? Uh, Madeline is 12, Ronan just turned 8, and Leland just turned 6. Okay. And are they in school in Dixon County? They are, yes. And where do they attend school? They go to Centennial. Okay. And that's where you're zoned to go through Liverpool. And Madeline's right? at TMS. She's at uh, the middle school. At middle school. Mm -hmm. Now, you and Mr. Stealthy started a relationship when? Uh, we started a relationship, uh, it would be January of... 2021. Okay, and how did y'all meet? Uh, we met online. Okay, um, and where was he living at the time? At the time, he was living in Clarksville. He was working in Clarksville as well. Clarksville, Tennessee, yes. is that correct? Mm -hmm. And y'all met online and you started dating, is that yes, correct? it is. Um, and did y'all move in together at some point in time? No, we, uh, I purchased my house and then subsequently he moved from his rental to a house that he had purchased. And where did he purchase a house? In Clarksville. In Clarksville. So y'all dated and then you discovered you were pregnant and you y'all delivered and had had Caden in September of 2022. Is that yes, correct? That is correct. So that makes Mr. Caden about 18 months old. Is that yes, right? He is. Um, any anything unusual about the pregnancy? No. Pretty okay. standard. Okay. And you and Mr. Stealthy had a sexual relationship, but y'all didn't cohabitate together. Is that That's correct? correct. Mm -hmm. um, and did he stay in Clarksville the whole time? He did. He would occasionally come and visit. I would visit over there, but it was never significant time that was spent at either location. He worked there, so obviously. Where did he work in, in Clarksville? He was working on base. Um, he worked as a uh, test engineer for the Army. Okay. So he ha he's an independent contractor working through for the military, but not in the military. Yes, right. Um, and as a result of that, he stayed there and worked. And what was his work schedule? Um, I mean, he worked daily, but sometimes he would travel, and he could travel anywhere from a couple weeks to over a month. So it would just depend. But you bought your home and you lived there. Yeah. And so. you had three other children, and then you had Mr. Caden. And did you take a, during the time of your pregnancy, y'all were not married. That's correct. Um, and did you you had health insurance? I take it. Yes. And. You delivered. Did he offer any financial support or anything um, during your pregnancy? He paid a couple of the bills, but anything that remained, I ended up having to pay after Kaiden was born. So. Okay. And you delivered, and, and was there a period of time that y'all began cohabitating after Kaiden was born? Yes. So after Kaiden was born, um, he would... Well, after Kaiden was born, he moved to Ohio. Um, and then it's once he moved back, which was end of May, um, that's when we were living together prior to us getting married. What year? It was 2023. Okay. So y'all are dating, you get pregnant, he has a home in Clarksville, you're living here in Dixon, you're going back and forth. Um, you deliver in September. When did he move to Ohio? He moved to Ohio, I think officially it was July. Um, before you had Caden before, yeah. in 2022, still, yes. so before you delivered your child, he had moved out of state, Yes. sold his house in Clarksville? He did. Mm -hmm. And did he get transferred through his job? He didn't. He actually got fired from his job, and then that's when he decided to relocate to pursue a different job. Okay. And so he moved for employment purposes? Yes. Where is he from originally? Um, originally, he was born in Hawaii. 
Okay. Um, but I believe most of his significant childhood, he lived in uh, Texas. So his family moved around quite a bit. Okay. And so he moved to Ohio and you didn't, at some point in time, after Caden was born, he was up there. So how often would he visit and, and visit with Caden? So he would visit about two to three weeks out of the month. Um, so it just depended on his schedule, also his schedule with his daughter. So okay. he saw her once, a, once one weekend out of the month. Okay. He has, a, was he previously married? He was. Yeah. And he has a daughter. He does. And what is that child's name? It is Lana, a Laura Stelsey. Okay. And how old is Miss Lana? She is seven years old. Okay. And he does not have custody of that child. He has visitation. He has right? visitation. That's and do you know, are you familiar through your conversations with him, what type of residential schedule he has? Yeah. So currently, because she is in school, um, she, he gets to see her one weekend out of the month. Um, and then I believe it's through the summer. Holidays are split. And does he, but he's, was in Clarksville, then Ohio, mm -hmm. now in Huntsville. How yes. do they, do you know how they exchange or what they do? Yeah, he's the one that goes and picks her up and then drops her off. So his parents um, were flight attendants, retired. So he has the ability to uh, travel through the airplane on uh, passes. Okay. So he he flies to Texas, yeah. visits down there. Yes. And and does that on an alter, um, once a weekend, one weekend per month. Is yes. that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, during the time y'all were together, did, did Alana come and visit with y'all any here? She did. Okay. And how often would he have her for an extended period of time? So just the summers, just holidays. So that was it. And apart from that, uh, once she was in school, it was just the one weekend out of the month. How, do you know how long he kept her in the summer? Um, I believe it's 55 days, but I'm not sure. I know extended it, period. Of time yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so he's moved to Ohio. Do you know where in Ohio? Um, it, I don't remember exactly what the city name was. It's, I don't remember. Um, sometimes after, 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 uh, your son was born, y'all decided to uh, make your relationship official and got married. Yes. And that was not till July of 2023. Is that That's right? correct. Yes. Was there a period of time when you were looking at relocating? Um, I was, yes. And where was that going to be? That was going to be originally to Ohio. Okay. Was that where his job was? It was. Yes. What do you do for a living? I am a medical coder. I've also worked in billing, but currently I'm doing coding. Well, as a medical coder, who do you work for? I work for Dixon Medical Associates uh, here in Dixon. Okay. And um, you're an employee of DMA. And do you, and as a medical coder, if you could just for the record, tell me what that is. Um, so essentially I review reports for providers, uh, whether it's surgery procedures, sometimes it's just the office visits, verify exactly what procedures were performed or what services were provided to the patient, um, as well as diagnoses. So what's associated with, you know, why they're coming in. And then um, that gets submitted to the insurance company. So you kind of translate from what was done, how they bill it. Yes. And, what, right. and put it under the coding bank, whatever the insurance code for whatever respective insurance company there is. Yeah. You make sure that those are conducive so that these and medical associates can get paid and that the patients don't have exorbitant out of pocket and it's covered by their insurance, correct? Yes. Now, where do you physically do that? I do it at home. <laughs> yes. So the medical coding job that you have, is it a Monday through Friday job? It is. And, and you have an office set up at your home? Yes. Dixon Medical Associates provides you with a computer, a telephone line. What do you do? Yeah, so I have my own personal computer. We have to go through um, like a cloud-based, um, but I do have my personal computer um, that I use. I have a phone line that goes through that same cloud base that I'm able to access through my computer. So. Okay. Because again, these are HIPAA issues yes. that you have to do. So those are secure lines yeah. that you do. You just not use in your phone line, your, yeah. your stuff, and you have that information digitally. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so, do you do you have a normal schedule? Yeah. So it is Monday through Friday, uh, seven to three thirty. Okay. And so, do you log on at seven o'clock in the morning three, and log off at three thirty? Yeah. Okay. Um, but they're at the home. Yes. That's so, correct. how do you deal with childcare and getting? You've got three kids that are in school and, you, and you've got your, your toddler. So my mom takes care of the kids and I pay her that way. You know, I have someone secure, you know, regardless of what's going on. If they're sick or they're on break, there's someone that's able to care for them. And who, what's your mother's name? Her name is Dominga Hernandez. 
And where did, where does Ms. Hernandez live? She lives at 651 Grindstone Hollow in Dixon. Okay. And so does she come to your house? You go to her house? What happens? She comes to my house, picks up all the kids. She'll take the bigger kids to school and then takes Kaiden uh, to her house and okay. from there. And how much do you pay her? I pay her $150 per week uh, for the care of Kaiden. And that's just to take care of the top? You, uh, just Kaiden, okay. yeah. Um, I also pay her separately for the bigger kids. For the bigger kids. Yeah. And so what time does she typically pick the kids up? Um, she's usually there by 645 to okay. pick up the kids. Okay, and then delivers them to mm -hmm. two different to schools? To the areas, yeah. And then goes, and then what time do you go pick pick them up in the afternoon? No, she will pick them up. She has Kaiden with her, so she'll go to the school, pick them up, and then bring them back to me. Okay. Um, and so that's, has, how long has that schedule been in existence? Since Madeline was born. So since Madeline was born and I was working, um, my mom was the one that cared for her. Um, once she started school, she was the one that would take them, pick them up. Um, so since, gosh, it's been years. And so Madeline's how old? Madeline's 12. 12. So, so, so a number of years this has been the yes. schedule. And so when you had the child with Mr. Stelzi, he just fell right into the plan. Yeah, Is that correct? Did. Now, what type of caregiving has has um, your husband provided to y'all's son? Um, the most that he's stayed with him is about two hours when we were married while we were both living together um, or when he would come to visit. It wasn't ever, you know, any significant amount of time outside of that. So he never had to stay with him alone overnight or for days at a time. Now, your son is a well child. No, no, no chronic medical conditions, no. nothing that he's just a normal healthy, old, yes. running around. Healthy, thriving, and very energetic. Okay. Um, but again, as far as day-to-day -day activities that, that y'all did as a family, as far as caregiving for the child, who, who does the laundry for I do. <laughs> How many times has Mr. Stealthy done that? Um, he would help occasionally, but he wouldn't do it consistently. Now, how long a period of time, again, I, I need to maybe quantify this, how long did y'all actually live together? So he moved in the end of May. Um, of 2023. Of 2023, and then left October 16 of 2023. So May, June, July, August, September, and then left October. Early, early October. Yeah, mid-October. Mid-October. So of the time that y'all were together, there was just five and a half, six months that they you know, actually go have to you together. And where was he working during that time? He was working in Huntsville. In Huntsville. Yeah. Okay. So he's in Ohio working, and then he got another. He got a job and moved. At what point in time? Um, he started working there, I believe, June. Because uh, he moved in just a couple days before he started working at the uh, Huntsville location. 2023. So yes. right before y'all married in July, mm -hmm. he had he had moved to Ohio, had a job there, yes. then tr got another job in, in Huntsville. Yes, that's correct. Um, and started working down there. What hours would he keep down there? Um, so initially he started, um, he would leave the house at about 6. I think it would take him two hours to get to work. So he would start at 8 and then he'd come home uh, about 4 or 5. Okay. And so he was doing the commute to Huntsville for those period yeah, of time. That's correct. Living in your home. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if Caden had to go to the doctor, who would carry the child to the doctor? I would or my mom would. Okay. How many occasions did he schedule a doctor's appointment and carry him to the doctor? Um, I think he scheduled one doctor's appointment that he'd attended while we were both there. And that's just because I had Kaiden and he was able to do it. So Okay. So he's been, he's, he's called and y'all been together. Yeah, he, we've been together to the appointments a couple times. Yeah. Okay, but then when you would, if, if your son, and he's not been, there's not been any chronic, other than just, well, maybe in shot stuff, yeah. there's not been any need to go back and forth. No. Would you notify him of when those those were scheduled? Yes, and would he make an effort to be there to go? Yeah. And you would keep him informed? Yeah, absolutely. But as far as the scheduling it and doing things like that, who would do it? Majorly me. <laughs> so. As, if, if there's been prescriptions or anything filled, who would have to get those done? Um, it, I mean, the doctor would send them, and it would just depend who was available. So while we were living together, it was whoever could. But prior to that, it would be me. <laughs> okay. And then subsequent to when he left in October. Yeah, today. it's been me the whole time. Um, now, what resulted in the leaving? In him leaving? 
Um, I found out that he was uh, on dating websites. I had also found underwear in my house that were not mine. Um, and underwear, are you talking about a female persuasion? Yes, okay. it was female underwear that were a size large, and I don't wear a large. I wear a small. So uh, I had asked my family, and I was like, are these yours? Because they're here, and I don't know whose they are. Um, but yes. Um, did you confront him about that? I did. He initially denied it, said maybe they were his sisters, maybe they were my mom's, maybe they were my sisters or my sister-in-law's. Um, they weren't anybody's. Nobody admitted to them being theirs. Um, and then later on is when I found out that he had been on dating websites and, you know, prior to him going to see Lana, he would get on the dating websites. So, but it went as far back as April. Okay. Do you know whether he brought a woman into your home? Um, he wouldn't have been able to bring a woman into my home because yeah. I'm always there. Um, yeah. But um, he could have definitely had times, you know, when he would go visit that I wouldn't talk to him for a couple hours because I'd let him spend his time with his daughter. So. Okay. And so as a result of that, y'all decided to separate? Yes, and at where, that point. And where did he go? Um, I actually don't know where he went. Um, following that, I think he may have had time at his uh, mom and sister's house. And where um, is that? That is in Virginia. Okay. Um, and I think he spent time with his friend, the one that's here. Um, and I believe he was in East Ohio, but maybe Pennsylvania now. I'm not quite sure where he's living okay. currently. But how often, when he left in October, was there some uh, discussion or anything about, okay, what we're going to do with our son? Um, I tried to discuss it with him multiple times. Um, the only time that he uh, really wanted uh, time to visit with him was through Thanksgiving, and it was for the whole week of Thanksgiving. Um, which he would have also had his daughter and he had not been away from me prior to then um other than that so thanksgiving 2023 yes thanksgiving so he left in october so the following month in, yes. in, in november did he contact you and say hey i want to visit um he did originally contact me and we uh, he was able to visit with kaiden on two occasions one of them was when he came and picked up uh, a honda odyssey that he had purchased um the week before we got married. Um, and the second time was when he picked up a Mustang that he had at my parents' house. Um, but it was about an hour of time that he visited and then he'd leave. Okay. And how many times since he left in October, other than those two occasions when he was getting some, some vehicles, how many occasions did he call and ask to visit? November, he called a couple times and we set those times up. Um, after about November 18th, mid-November, we didn't really discuss anything. Um, so he completely stopped calling starting December. Okay. Um, and not until we went to court did I hear anything back from him. That was the first time I had seen him or heard of him since. Okay. But didn't call, didn't show up, didn't no. say, can I have him this weekend? Mm -hmm. no. Radio silence. Yes, silence. And who was caring for him during that period of time? I was, I was caring for Kai. What kind of financial support was he providing for you during that time? None. So y'all, he officially left in October. Did y'all commingle your assets or did, did you do anything? No, we had everything separated. I never changed my name. We never, you know, got put on each other's bank accounts or cards, anything of the sort. So, and so when you, for that period of time, um, you said like from May of, I think you said May of 2022, 23, 23. Uh, 22 until October of 23 when y'all lived together for that kind of six month, excuse me, six month period of time y'all lived together, May. Um, did y'all each kind of pay your own way? Um, so he did start contributing to the household expenses, so uh, the mortgage, the utilities, um, but I paid for any of my bills, he essentially paid for his, so anything that he had. And so, and how would y'all deal with, with Caden's expenses? Well, so other than the house and uh, the utilities, he didn't really contribute. He didn't significantly give me money. I think there were a couple times that I asked if he was going to help with the child care portion of it, but it wasn't anything significant or uh, that was set up routinely. But from October until we went to court in January, how much, how much you didn't have any some brief discussion, maybe October, early November. Yeah. How much money did he did he give to you to assist in the raising of his child? None. No money. Um, was he aware of the the arrangement 
having lived there for a period of time and your child being on this, you know, after being born, somebody having to take care because we both have to work. Yes. Was he aware that your mother was the caregiver? Yes. Was he aware of the fact? Did y'all have discussion about the fact that you were paying her to do that? Yes. He okay. Did. And did he ever offer after he left to, to assist in that in any way? He did not. And so other than when we came to court in January, did you ever deny him residential time? With your, with your the family? only time was the November. That's the only time we ever discussed about him spending time. And that's because he wanted him for the entire week. And previous to that, he hadn't had any overnight time with anyone. Okay. Did you know where he was even going to be during that period? Of time? I didn't. He didn't discuss that with me. Okay. Were you, and yeah, other than, yeah, you can see him, but where not the whole week? Yeah, I told him that I didn't think the whole week would be a good idea just because he hadn't been away from me. Um, I was still nursing, so he had never, you know, had to significantly, you know, sit down, take a bottle for multiple days at a time. He would here and there, but, you know, he had never even offered him milk um, consistently. And any time that we tried to introduce it, he was like, well, he doesn't want to take it here. You give it to him. Um, so there just wasn't enough involvement to where I felt like him being away for a week uh, would be something that would be beneficial for the child. Um, so. Okay. And so then uh, we come in January and find mm -hmm. out that morning that he's going to be out of the country. Yeah. Uh, and so he went and had visited with Caden that afternoon. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. And then he's had a weekend when he came back. Yes. Let's was... talk about that because, again, um, give me your rendition. When we were here, we announced what yeah. was going to happen. We had very specific mm -hmm issues that he was going y'all were going to meet yeah. for him to see his child after he had not seen him for a period of time yeah. was he there he was not so he messaged me the night before saying that he wasn't going to be able to pick him up uh the next day because he was he got stuck somewhere else because of flights he wasn't going to be there um so originally he wanted to uh pick him up at a later time um due to the in inability to settle on anything we ended up um, he was able to get his sister uh, to come and pick Kaiden up. Okay, you. I mean, we had, we were here January thirtieth, yes. and so a month and a half, Janu the whole month of February and in, into March, we there there was a court order down saying what time he was going to be there. Yes, and you anticipated he would be capable and, and able bodied enough to follow that written word. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so had you made arrangements on the day that y'all were supposed to exchange? Did you have an appointment? Yes, I had an appointment at 1045. Okay. Because um, what time were y'all supposed to exchange the child? We were supposed to exchange them at 10 a.m. And where were you exchanging him? Uh, the night before, we decided the McDonald's right off of Spring Hill exit okay. on 65. Okay. And where was your appointment? Uh, my appointment was in Franklin. Okay. So again, you had plenty yeah. of time to be there at 10 and to be at your appointment at 1030. So the day before, you get a phone call, text message, text, a text, yes. and again, we'll, when we get him there, we've got the text message. So what, and saying he couldn't be there. Yeah, he couldn't be there. Yes. And um, you could, you could accommodate a later time. Yes. Okay. So what ended up happening? Um, so he, uh, his sister came into Nashville. Um, she From messed, where? Uh, I don't know where. I'm assuming Virginia, but she's a flight attendant, so it could have been from anywhere. Um, so uh, she had messaged me, letting me know that she was going to be late, uh, that she was going to be there about 10.20. Um, so I got there prior to just to make sure that we would be there at 10 o'clock um, for the exchange. So you were there at 10 o'clock at the designated location? Yes, I was there prior to. Um, so at 10.20, she still hadn't gotten there. At 10.25, she still hadn't gotten there. She had messaged me again saying that she would be there at 10.26. By 10.26, she still wasn't there. By 10.28, I sent him a message letting him know that I'd be leaving by 10, like after 10.30. Um, and I called him at 10.30 and said, hey, there's no one here. I've got to leave. I'm going to leave. Um, and I informed him that I would be leaving. Um, his sister did message me, but um, it was after that. Uh, she messaged me at 10.31 letting me know that, you know, she had been there, which I was still in the parking lot and no one else had come through. So. Okay. And then at that point, I left to go to my appointment. Okay. Did you were you able to be late for your appointment? Yes, uh, I made it like right on time. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, and so then we got a notification from his attorney that you had failed to allow him to have his residential time. Yes. Okay. And that was just 
Incorrect, isn't that right? Yeah, I was there at the time that he was supposed to be there, that his sister was supposed to be there. Uh, he called me afterwards to try and arrange a time. Um, I think he got into Nashville about 1240 is when he had messaged me. Mm -hmm. um, but it ended up that at that point, uh, we weren't able to have a productive conversation. But again, uh, consistent with the email that we got, Mr. It, Mr. Steltsy was to pick Caden up from Ms. Hernandez and she refused to hand the child over that he called the police and he filed did. an incident report yes. and that um, informed that you would be in contempt of court because you did not comply with the order. Yes, that's what the uh, sergeant told me, yeah. Okay. And again, at my direction, you told the police they could get in touch with me if they needed any further discussion yeah. about what was contempt and what was it contempt. Yeah, at that point, I just dropped it. I would ask for the report that way I could provide it to you. Yes. Yes. Okay. What do you think is in your child's best interest? Um, he's had limited contact since October. Um, it's just difficult to say uh, because even though I know Mr. Stalsey wants one week on, one week off, he still hasn't even had an overnight with him. The overnight that he was supposed to have, he wasn't able to make it to the pickup. Um, so I feel like every other weekend, given the circumstances that he has to travel on a whim um, and his inconsistency in his schedule every other weekend would be what would be the best interest for Kaiden. And you think that it, starting out getting him, getting, getting your son, and I keep calling him Kaiden. How do you pronounce it? It's Kaiden. Kaiden. Yes. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Excuse my son. It's, hey, it's everyone, so it's okay. fine. That, but Kaiden, yeah. um, to get him used to in a routine, yeah. you think that that would be appropriate? Yes. Is that correct? Do you, have you been provided an address in, in, uh, Huntsville, where he's living? He hasn't. The only address that I know is what came through uh, the divorce papers. Okay. Has he discussed with you? Does he? Who is Kaden's Kayden, primary care physician? Um, currently, it's uh, Kelly Sharp. Okay. So prior to that, it was Carol Moore. But once Kelly opened her office, I love her, adore her. She was my she was my doctor growing up. So yeah, okay. and Miss Sharp has just reopened her pediatric clinic. Is that correct? That is correct. And Miss Carol was through Dixon Medical Associates. She too. was yes. She's my neighbor. So I love her, adore she's, her. Uh, she's sweet. And so, um, has he discussed with you? You heard his attorney say, "Oh, he's picked out a pediatrician." Mm -hmm. You know, has that been a discussion? It hasn't been a discussion. No, I haven't talked to him since. You uh, provided he was... any information about? Oh, this is a daycare where he'll be staying. No. I haven't. Have you been provided his work schedule and saying this is what will? No, I don't know anything. Well, tell me what communication y'all had. Uh, we haven't. So, like I said, November, mid to end November, that was about the last time we really discussed anything. Um, we didn't talk in December, didn't talk in January until the court date. Uh, since then, while he was traveling, he called a couple times. Um, but. I haven't heard anything about what his plans were, you know, who he has found, what he has found, anything of the case. So I don't know anything about what he plans on doing as far as for the care of Kaiden. Okay. And he has a routine. <laughs> yes. He has siblings here. You now your siblings are involved in extracurricular activities, is that they correct? Are. Yes. And 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 Kaiden goes and participates. Mm -hmm. We're at the soccer field and yeah. different things like gymnastics. that. Gymnastics. He's hanging off of little bars at gymnastics, just swinging his little legs. Uh -huh. So yeah. yes. So again, you have a routine, and you think a routine for a child like that is is necessary. Is it that correct? Is. Yes. All right. That's all. now again. We put in some information about your income mm -hmm. previously that we agreed to, and it's set forth in the order. We have put in, and just to just to verify, mm -hmm. we had calculated. Um, what your income, your average monthly income was at three thousand five hundred and twenty, and and uh, and all of those figures are correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And who keeps health insurance on your son? I have health insurance. I know that previously Chris did too. I don't know if he still has. It so each of y'all keep it, and you have to keep it for your other children yes, too. That's so correct. it's not really additional any any additional cost for your son to be involved because you do keep it for your three other children. That's Is that correct. correct? Yeah. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Now she's gonna have some questions, so just keep you safe. Okay. Keep you safe. You may cross examine. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So you discussed your house that uh, Mr. Stelsey moved into. Yes. In October, when he moved out, did you ask him to move out? Uh, no, he had been threatening that he was going to leave, and I told him that he could leave. That if that's what he wanted and that's what would make him happy, that's what he could do. And did an argument kind of incite that move out? Absolutely, yes. Were the police called during that argument? Uh, no, I went to the police station because um, he had been threatening, making threats. Um, so I went to the police station to see what they advised. Okay, and um, did you take out any protection orders or do anything from there? I didn't, no. Okay. Um, have you threatened to call the police on Mr. Stelsey since then? He showed up at my house. Um, I believe it was the 27th of November. Uh, it might be a couple days off. Um, but he showed up uh, unannounced um, to my house and I did call the police um, because I had not agreed on him being there. And due to the arguments that we had had prior to, I did not feel comfortable with him just showing up and me not having someone uh, there with me. Do you know why he showed up? Um, yes, so he called me the week prior telling me that he was going to come to my house while I was currently working um, to pick up some of the items that he had left. Um, and I told him that I would gladly, you know, we could arrange something on a weekend. Um, that way I wasn't at work. That way I could plan ahead. Um, he said, well, I'll be there on Saturday. I said, I can't, I'm not agreeing to that. So I had already made plans for that Saturday um, and I was actually getting up, getting ready to leave uh, prior to him coming. And um, that weekend, did Mr. Celsi get to see Kaiden at all? Uh, no, I called the cops. Uh, there was an officer that came and talked to me. I believe he also called the cops, um, stating that I was not allowing him to take his property. Um, so a cop came in, took the keys, closed the door behind him, and then I believe that uh, Chris left right after that. Okay. Um, have you ever, have you blocked Mr. Stelsey's number at all during this? No, so he actually still has uh, my phone line. He's still paying on my line. Um, I have pictures of where his phone uh, contact shows where it's not blocked. I don't have any access to the current T-Mobile account uh, because it's under him and I believe his brother-in-law. Um, so I'm not able to access the account at all. Have you sent Mr. Celsi any updates through text or anything during the months he's been away? No, I have not had any contact with him. He hasn't initiated any contact and I wasn't gonna force him to have any level of relationship that he didn't wanna have. <clears throat> have there been any events or situations that since October that to deal with Kaiden that maybe Mr. Celsi should have been informed about? Not that I can any, remember of. Any illness? No, no illnesses. He's been pretty healthy. The only thing that he's had is this month. Uh, he had his 18-month appointment, but um, I haven't heard uh, from him since uh, he was supposed to pick Kaiden up. So, uh. Uh, Real quick, I want to talk about the daycare. So you said you pay hundred your mom 150 per week. Yes. And you pay that... That's for Kaiden and the other children are a separate payment. Yes, it's a separate payment. How much do you pay for the other children? Um, the same, 150 So $50 per child for the pickup and the drop-off. That also includes uh, any of the vacations. So it doesn't change for summer break or for any of the other breaks that they have from school. Okay, so she charges you three times the amount for Kaiden than the other children? Yes, because she has him full time and in Dixon currently um, off of daycares that I've seen, it's right under $200 to a little bit over $200 for uh, the weekly child care expense. So about how long did Mr. Stelsey live in your house with Kaiden and your three other children? Um, so he moved the end of May um, and then he left October 16th of 2023. So it's safe to say you trusted him around your other children and Kaiden. He never gave me any reason to believe that he wasn't trustworthy as far as with the kids. Before October, would you have said he was a good father? Um, he had instances with his daughter where he would get very aggravated and blame her for things that were not truly hers to be blamed for. Um, I know that he has a history of depression, anxiety. Um, where he would tell her that she was making him anxious 
Um, so that was my only concern. Um, I think he tried to be a good dad, uh, but there were some instances where, you know, it, the way that he responded to situations could have been deemed inappropriate. How many times did Kaiden and uh, Mr. Celsius' daughter, how many days were they together in, in your house? Um, so he had Lana for the summer break from uh, the beginning of June. Um, I can't remember exactly what date, um, but until about, I can't remember if it was end of July, mid to end July, I wanna say. Um, so about a month and a half. So is it just you and, so you and your children living in the home? Yes. How many bedrooms does that home have? It is a three bedroom, two bath. So does Kaiden have his own room? Uh, he doesn't have his own room. He's still currently in my room just because I still nurse overnight. He still wakes up to nurse. So, so Kaiden's not sleeping through the night right now? Uh, no, he is not sleeping through the night. Does he ever take a bottle in the night? Um, he won't take a bottle overnight. Um, he'll take a bottle through the day with my mom. Uh, but he still doesn't really want to take milk uh, with me. He'd rather just nurse. But he can take a bottle. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before Mr. Stelsey moved out, did he do um, any evening care with Kaiden? Uh, he would occasionally bathe them, but it was on and off. So he would help with getting him ready for bed. Uh, but it would just depend on what our schedule was, what was going on with the other kids. And then would he care for him in the morning? Uh, no, he would leave, uh, like I said before, he Kaiden was even up. So anything overnight morning time was all on me. Did you drive your other children to school in the mornings? No, my mom does. <clears throat> and have you left Kaiden alone with Mr. Celsi during the day? Uh, for two hours, that was the most, and that's like, when he would schedule for me to go get a massage or to have time to myself. But apart from that, it wasn't um, any significant amount of time. Okay. That's all my questions, Your Honor. Reader. How long did you nurse your other children? Two and a half years. All of them. <laughs> all of them. Yes, that's all, thank you. All right, thank you, you may step down. It took about a five minute recess. All right.
Your Honor, unless without objection, I had passed to the clerk. I had uh, asked Mr. Hernandez if her income had changed any, and I had pre prepared an income and expense statement for the previous hearing, and I just moved that in as evidence just for the purpose of the exhibit. child support. Exhibit one. And Your Honor, I would now call uh, Mr. Christopher Steltzi to the stand. Thank you. Come around, please. Elsie, raise your right hand be placed under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the three posts are the truth of the truth of Yes. State your name, please, sir. Christopher Ali'i Stelsey. And Mr. Stelsey, how old are you? 35. And what, what do you do for a living, please, sir? I work for the Missile Defense Agency. The Missile Defense Agency? Yes, of the government. So you're employed by the United States government? I am employed by a contractor that goes, that is directly okay. employed by the government, okay. yes. Okay, Mr. Stelsey, who do you work for? What is the name of the company, the contractor that you work for? It's Canvas. Canvas? Canvas. And how long have you been employed by Canvas? Since June of 2023. Uh, June of 2023. And as, as being employed through Canvas, you're a civilian contractor with the Miss, Missile Defense Agency that's located in Huntsville, Alabama, is that correct? Is that correct? Yes. And again, previously, when we were in court in January, um, you pulled up some information on and and stated that your average income monthly income is nine thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars is that still correct sir yes did you bring a paycheck stub or something to indicate what that is yes you did yes could you retrieve that please for me Okay, your attorney has handed to me what appears to be a paycheck stub um, for a pay period ending on 229 of 24. Shows you get paid semi monthly, is that correct? Yes. And it states you're a salaried employee, is that correct? Yes. And what is what is your salary? Uh, 117,000 approximately. 117,000. It shows your year-to-date income on a pay period ending on 229 of 24, of $24,116.90. Would that be, Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Mr. Chelsea, I'm going to show you what I'm reading off of, and this looks like from Campus Roman numeral 2 LLC, located in Huntsville, Alabama, it indicates this is your paycheck stub. The page stub was written to you on 215, but it's for a pay period between 216 and 229. So you get paid semi-monthly, so you get paid twice a month, correct? Correct. And it shows your year-to-date income. If I come down here, your year-to-date income, which would have been as of 229, would have been $24,416.40. Is that correct? That's the gross amount. Yes. Yes, sir. That's what, what it indicates. Isn't that correct? Yes, that's, that is the gross amount. Okay. And then you've handed another, she's handed me another paycheck stub that appears to be the next one in sequence. And this would have been the pay period for 329, and it was for the first half of the month from March 1st of 2024 to March 15th of 2024. And then it's 29,299.68. You agree with me that that's what these documents say? Yes, those are the gross amounts.
Your Honor, we'll move these in as the next exhibit. Exhibit two. Now, sir, you, you have another child, is that correct? Yes. And uh, pursuant to a court, uh, do you have a court order as it relates to that child? Yes. And from what court is that order entered from? Um, Williamson County in uh, Brown Rock, Texas. In t Williamson County, but not in Tennessee, out of Texas? Yes. Okay, and are you ordered to keep health and hospitalization insurance on your child? Yes. And so you have you have your son, Kaiden, covered also? Yes. But it doesn't cost you anything additional to have him covered, is that correct? Correct. But it does cost me additional to have Yvette and her kids on my insurance. Okay. Well, you understand she has her own insurance policy. She told me while we were uh, when we were together that she wanted me to have insurance on her and her children as well. Well, thank you for your gratuitous statement, but I didn't ask you that, sir. Does it cost you any more to have Kaiden on your health insurance? No. Okay. Now, what do you do for Canvas at the Mitchell Defense Agency? What is the nature of your employment? I'm a test resources manager. And what does that mean? When the United States government wants to conduct a missile test mm -hmm. uh, for the defense of the country, they need to have all the resources in place. And that is my job to ensure that we have those resources. Okay, so again, it, your your job is is more of a um, supply chain type scenario. No. Are you are you computer type? I mean, what is it? I'm that, an engineer. You're an engineer. Yes. Okay, um, and so what hours do you work? I work from seven to three thirty, sometimes seven to four. Monday through Friday. Yes. And what's your physical location of your employment? On Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, at the MDA headquarters there. Okay. Now, in your current employment, you we were here in January, and you had received notification that you had to travel as a result of your employment. Is that correct? Yes. And is that something that you will occasionally have to do also? Yes. Okay. And in this current employment that you've had since June of 2023, how many occasions have you had to travel? Um, twice. And when uh, this last one and you had to go, where did you go? To Guam. To Guam. And you were there for about a month? Yes. Um, and then where was the previous time that you had to travel? Um, to uh, the White Sands Missile Range in um, uh, New Mexico. Okay. And how long were you out there? Two weeks, a week. Okay. And and how often notice are you given when, when it comes, again, it may be emergent scenario given the job that you have in the state of the world, but typically do you have a window? Um, it does vary uh, based on the requirements and needs of the government, um, but typically I'm given about a month sometimes two weeks notice. Okay. Well, because again, when we were here in, in January, that, that hearing had been scheduled for quite some time. And um, we only discovered it the morning of the hearing. How much notice had you received that you had to be out of the country um, before we were here at the end of, on January 30th, 2024? About three weeks. So you had known for three weeks? Uh, prior to then. Uh -huh. Uh, I was notified about three weeks prior to me leaving, yes. Okay. And you left like the day after we were in court, um, two days after we were in court. I think that's what it was. Something similar to that. Huh? Something similar to that, yes. Yeah. So you had known three weeks prior. Did you notify? Uh, I notified Ms. my attorney. Okay. But not Ms. Hernandez that you were going out of the country? I didn't leave the country. I thought, well, Guam is a territory of the United States. Excuse me, the contiguous 48 states. You left the United States and went to another province of the United States, a principality. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Guam's I not mean, a state, is it? It's a territory of the United States. Okay. 
again, initially the question, and we'll talk about geography and, and, and states' rights on another date, um, but again, did you notify the mother of your child that you were leaving and going to a territory and leaving the contiguous 48 states? No, she did not allow contact with, with her between me and her or me and Kaiden at that time. How, what, what's the basis of your statement that she did not allow contact? She had blocked my phone from what contacting e her. What evidence do you have to show that? I have, I tried to call and it, it would go to voicemail every time. You don't have any evidence to show that she had put a block on your phone? Other than not being able to contact her, no. And how many occasions did you try to contact her? Multiple. Okay. So it went to voicemail, so you understand that's going to register on your phone plan? Sure. And you have control and dominion over her phone? I, correct? I, it's on your plan. I don't have control and dominion over her phone. It is, I am a co on my brother-in-law's plan. Okay. Have you authorized her as a user? No, she's never asked to be a user. Okay. Again, I appreciate your gratuitous statements, but if you could just direct your answers to the questions that are asked, please, sir. Are you capable of doing that? I'm answering your questions. Okay. You did not, you and she did not cohabitate until I guess your son was about seven or eight months old. Is that correct? Um, he was born in, in September and I'm... September of 2022. Yes. And I moved in, she says... Uh, uh, that's, okay, about six months old is when I believe. Okay, he, she cites you moved in at the end of May. So October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Excuse me for using my fingers. I'm not no, an engineer. I, I had to do it as well. Okay. So that would have been six, seven, six and a half, seven months old. I, Eight. Correct. I believe it was six. Okay. And prior to that, he did not ever reside with you in your home in Clarksville, did he? Except when Mrs. Except on occasion when Miss Hernandez would come and bring him there. Is that correct? correct? And you moved in, uh, and at the point in time you, you had moved, at some point in time you moved to Ohio, correct? Correct. And you moved to Ohio when? From Clarksville to Ohio? I believe it was June of 2022. Right before Caden. Caden was born in September, so before Caden was born you moved to Ohio, yes. and you stayed in Ohio from Clarksville from June of 2022 until you moved down here in May of 2023. Is that right? In March, yes. Okay. You moved in March? I believe I moved in March in, of 2023 prior okay. to the sale of my home into the house with Yvette, uh -huh. or excuse me, with Miss Hernandez. Okay. And did you buy a house in Ohio? Yes. And so when was that? So when, whatever the documents say when that was sold would indicate when you moved down here. No, I had moved prior to the sale of the home and I was going up there as needed to finish the sale of the home. Okay. And had you thought you were going to be relocated up there in a job or did you just move up there to look for a job? What was your purpose of moving from Clarksville where you lost a job and moved up there? Uh, I needed a job so that I could take care of um, my financial situation. Um, and they offered me a job at Boeing in Ohio. Okay. And so you went to Ohio for the purpose of a job. It wasn't family. I mean, you went up there. To... Yvette had mentioned to me that she wanted to start a new life together. And she said Ohio would work okay. because I had a, a good, stable job. Okay. And then you later took a job. To be closer to home, to family. Okay. I, I got a job at the missile defense agency okay. and again i don't mean this disrespectful what what family are you talking about yvette and her children and mm -hmm. our son kaiden okay not your extended you were referencing your family 
that we're dealing with here today. Yes. Not your, where's your mom? Uh, they're in Virginia. Okay. And then you've got a daughter who's in Texas. Yes. Um, and that's where you were married and divorced. We were married in Arizona. Okay. She left the home. Uh, she took Lana and left the home and went to her parents' house in Austin and um, then filed for divorce in Texas. Okay. And, and what is your residential schedule with Miss Lana? I see her um, on a once a month basis for a weekend. Um, and then I get her for 65 days during the summer and every other holiday. And the once a weekend during the school year, during the school year, other than, than the summer, is that a designated weekend or? I get to choose. You get to choose. And do you typically, as you heard Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Yvette stated because of your family situation who have, who are involved with the airlines, you're able to fly at a reasonable rate. Yes. And so you fly to Texas to visit your child, stay down there in a hotel? Yes. Uh, once a month? Yes. At, on a day of your choosing? And, and how would you pick that day? I choose it based on the school schedule. Um, usually there's a weekend that has extra days, so it's a four day. a Monday or a Friday? Yes. Okay. So I get the, to maximize my time with my daughter. Okay. And where in Texas? Brown Rock. It's north of Austin. Brownville? North of Austin. Yeah, well, you said another. A Round time. Rock. Round Rock. I'm sorry. I'm kind of hard of hearing. And then your summer residential time, when does it start and end? Uh, time of my choosing. As so long you, as it's 65 days. Okay, so you, you, it's 65 solid days, so you just give your ex notice I'm picking her up this day and I'll bring her back 65 days later. Yes. Okay. And then how do y'all do the holidays? Because again, it's um, mentioned, it's mentioned in the decree that uh, on odd years, she gets the, she gets Lana and on even years, I get these holidays. And so it, it, do, you, it do you usually fly and get her and bring her back someplace or do yes. you usually go down there? I bring her back. Okay. And where are you living in Huntsville now? Is North it, Huntsville. Is it, is it the address that you have on your complaint for divorce in the yes. apartment? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so you rent an apartment down there. And who lives there with you? Me. That's it. Now, when you left in October, for whatever the circumstances, when you, you, you agree that you and she separated in October? Yes. Um, and from that point forward until we went to court in Jan at the end of January, you provided no financial support for your son, did you? No. And you were working at this, this company during that period of time? Yes. You had the financial ability to support your child, correct? Yes. Um, and you just elected not to do it? I asked my attorney what I should do, if I should be paying, and she said there was no um, directive from the court and since there was no available contact with Ms. Hernandez. We should just wait. How much do you, how much support do you pay for your daughter? Um, a thousand dollars a month. One thousand a month. And are you current on that payment? Yes. Now you additionally understood the schedule that Kaiden was on that after he was born, um, that Ms. Hernandez's mother 
was the was the babysitter for the child. Correct? Uh, yes. And you understood she was paid to do that. Correct? Yes. And you didn't offer any assistance to offset that. Is that correct? No. Now, you left and went to Guam, and then did you, you had a scheduled return date, correct? Yes. Did you have a ticket to return? Yes. A designated, you weren't flying standby? No. You had a designated time and date of departure and knew that you were supposed to be back to pick your child up on Saturday, March 9th at 10 a.m.? Yes. Why were you not, you were not at the designated lo location on Saturday, March 9th at 10 a.m., were you? I was not there. Where at, were you? Uh, at 10 a.m. Where were you? I was on my way back to Nashville. Where were you? I was on my way back to Nashville from Texas. Were you in the air? There were airplane delays due to weather and spring break. Okay. So there, due to that, which I explained to Ms. Hernandez, I would be there at 12.30 instead of 10. And she said, because I wouldn't be there at 10, I was going to forfeit my time. But I tried to work with her the night before and she said no. It's your testimony here under oath that the night before you text message, not did not have a verbal, did you have a verbal conversation with Ms. Hernandez? No, I would like all conversations to be. Okay. I didn't ask what you liked, sir. It was a very simple, simple, simple question. Did you have, let me, let me just start again. On the night before, which would have been on Friday, March 8th, did you have any verbal communication with Ms. Vet Hernandez? Yes or no? No. Did you text message or email her on Friday, March 8th? Yes. What time did you send written communication to her, sir? I don't have that in front of me. I don't remember. Morning, noon, night. It was afternoon. Where were you physically located? Your person, your being. Where were you physically located at the time that you sent a written digital communication to Yvette Hernandez? In Texas. Where in Texas? Were you at an airport? Were you at a hotel? Were you in a car driving between Austin? <laughs> yes, sir. Do you find this humorous? No, you're being very confrontational and it feels you're being quite rude and it's very uncomfortable. Well, I would appreciate if you could talk to me politely. I would appreciate if you could answer a simple question I, as an engineer. I thought you might be able to do that, sir. Are you capable? Am I am not stupid. I didn't think you were. You just implied. Are you manipulative? I have not been. Okay. Now, where were you in Texas? At an airport, at somebody's home, at a hotel? Where were you? I was at a hotel in Round Rock, Texas. Visiting with your daughter? Yes. Had you had that weekend back to visit with your daughter? Yes. So when did you get back from Guam? I got back on Thursday night, and I went to pick her up on Friday morning. Okay. Okay. And so you knew you were, you were going to have to leave to come back on that Saturday to visit with your son? Yes. And you had it, it's your testimony under oath that you had a ticket, or let me ask this, what time, what airline was your ticket on? United. And what was your flight, do you recall what your flight number was? No. What time was your scheduled, where were you departing out of, out of United? Austin Airport. Austin. And what time was your departure on Saturday morning? 
I don't remember. But you knew on Friday that there was going to be flight delays and because of weather in spring break. Because you called, you, again, you sent digital communication to her on Friday stating you couldn't be there at 10 o'clock, correct? Yes. So when did you know, when were you notified on Friday that the, that the flight that you can't tell us when your time to leave was on Saturday, when were you notified by, the, by United that that flight was not going to leave so that you weren't going to arrive at BNA Nashville Metropolitan Airport with sufficient time to drive from there to the Spring Hill exit? When did you notify that as on Friday As soon as night? I found out, I notified Ms. Hernandez. So you're telling me there was communications from United Airlines saying that your flight, that you can't tell us when you were supposed to leave on Saturday, that on Friday you were notified via some type of an electronic communication that your flight was delayed the next day. Is that correct? Due to weather, weather complications in spring break, yes. Well, which was it? Weather complications in, in, and spring? I mean, what does spring break have to do with weather complications, sir? It has to do with the airlines overselling flights because they have predictions on when flights and how flights will go. I don't understand all of that, but that's how airlines operate. Well, you usually can check into the airlines, United being one of them. You can check in 24 hours before. And then depending on whether you check in is whether you're bumped or not. So are you telling me you were bumped from a flight? I was trying to get home and there was did you, did you understand I asked you, did you get bumped from the flight? No. Did you have a seat on an airplane designated a seat and a ticket to get on an airplane on Saturday morning to fly back into Nashville on Saturday? Yes. What time were you supposed to leave? Early in the morning, I was supposed to arrive at I don't believe, I don't remember the exact time, but it was before 10 a.m. in Nashville. Okay. And, you, and, and the day before you were notified that that wasn't gonna happen? Correct. And how were you notified? I was, uh, there's an, uh, a portal which, we, which my family uses to look online and that's how we were notified. Wow. What was your family notified about? I'm talking about you. That's how we look at the flights online. So you, you were, were you flying a friends and family ticket? I had purchased a discount ticket for me and my daughter to get back through the airlines. Through the friends and family program. And you get bumped, don't you, if, if, they're, if the flight's over, oversold, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay, we'll get we'll get to that. But again, the point being is you didn't show up on time, and then you had directed your attorney to send a threatening letter saying that they were going you were going to hold my client in contempt of court because she denied letting you have your child. Is that what you said? Not exactly. Did you get a copy of the email that was sent? Yes. It's brought to my attention that on March 9th, when Mr. Stelty was to pick up Caden from Mrs. Hernandez, she refused to hand the child over. Yes. You were there at 10 o'clock in the morning at the designated location, and Mrs. Hernandez refused to turn that child over. No. And then, and that Mr. Stelty filed a police report recording to the incident. Apparently, Mrs. Hernandez was informed she would be in contempt of court if she did not allow Mr. Stelty his parenting time, but she stated she didn't care. Is that the information you relayed to your attorney and directed her to contact me? That is what was told. The second portion of that is what was told to me by the officer. Did you arrange for your sister to be at, at the designated location at 10 o'clock? When I asked, you don't want me to explain, yes. Was she there at 10 o'clock? Uh, she told me that she was there and she showed me her tickets and she was running late because she had not ever been to this area before. Where was your sister coming from? Virginia, from her home. So she get on a plane and fly here and get yes. a rental car? Yes. 
I mean, she was running late. Yes. Did you relate any of the fact that you weren't, did, did you relate any fact that you were not there to the police officer, that you were supposed to be there at 10 o'clock and you told the police officer you weren't there? Yes. Did you tell the police officer your sister wasn't there at 10 o'clock? I told her that she was attempting to get in contact with Yvette or Ms. Hernandez, but Ms. Hernandez never told my sister what car she was in, where she was, or had, or and she also refused to text or call, receive phone calls from my sister. And that's what your sister said. We have documentation of that, but yes. When did you get to Nashville? Twelve thirty. Exactly when I told Miss Hernandez I would be there. Okay. The night before? Yes. What time did you leave Texas? <laughs> Whenever the flight left. I, I don't know that data offhand. You know exactly you landed at 1230, just like you said, but you don't know any other data. Right? <laughs> if no. After March 9th and 10th, have you contacted her and asked to see your son? No. Is this your Easter with your daughter? Um, Tomorrow is a, a, typically a school holiday in Tennessee. It is. I'm not familiar with Texas and you alternate. Are you scheduled to see your daughter this weekend? No. When's your next time? April um, 12th. And are, have you already got tickets? Yes. And how long are you staying? Is that a long holiday for no. her or is it a spring break or anything? No. So you're just going for Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Yes. How far do you live from your apartment to Redstone Arsenal? Approximately six miles. But you're off on weekends. Yes. And you can spend quality time with your child. Yes. That's all. Thank you, sir. You may question your client. <clears throat> And in doing so, put on whatever proof you plan to put on. Don't you don't have to just address what she's been asked. Put on whatever you want to put on in the way. Of okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Stelsey, tell me about. So, what hours do you work? I typically work from seven a.m. to three thirty or four p.m. And do you work in an office? Yes. Do you work? Can you work remote? Yes, my position is fully a uh, remote position, but I go in to establish communication with the government. If you got Kaiden during the week, would you work remotely? Yes. And you said you now live very close to your employer? Yes. Um, when you lived with Ms. Hernandez, would you drive to Alabama every day? Every day. About how long that is that drive? About two hours. Okay. So you, the reason you moved is just to make the day-to-day -day easier, correct? Yes. But you're willing to travel, to pick up, see Kaiden? I would do anything for Kaiden. <clears throat> Tell me about the day you moved out. What was the situation? Um, Yvette, or excuse me, Miss Hernandez, I was making her dinner and she had had a rough day and she came home uh, from picking up the children at her mother's house and she lost her temper for whatever reason and she said I'm going to take the kids and you're never going to see them again and she took the kids in the minivan and then the next thing I know, I received a phone call from the police saying 
that she was terrified and wouldn't come home until I had been gone. So what did you do next? I packed up some things and I uh, left the, the home. Where'd you go? Um, <laughs> I slept in my car. And then you got an apartment? Uh, after that, uh, I, after sleeping in my car for a few days at, in Huntsville, I um, moved, or I took some of my stuff and I went to my parents' house in Virginia for a while. Okay. And did you call Miss Hernandez during the time you were living in your car? Um, yeah, we were, we talked both text and um, phone call. And did you ask about Kaiden? Yes, then? I always ask about Kaiden. Did you ask to see him? Yes. And what was the answer? No. Do you know why the answer was no? She was afraid that I was going to take him away from her. Would you do that? No. Okay. Um, so she called the police. Do you need clearance for your employment? Yes. So what would happen if the police got involved in a situation with you? I could lose my clearance and lose my job. <clears throat> Pivoting back to work real quick. Um, would you be able to care for Kaiden during work hours? I know you're working remote, but yes, would, um, your job would allow kind of that double. Yes. What do you typically do while you're working remote? Like computer work? Yes. Just computer work, phone calls? Computer work and phone calls, yes. Okay. <clears throat> How old were was your daughter when you and her mother separated? Uh, approximately three and a half. And were you living with your daughter for those three and a half years full time? Yes. And did you care for her? I, I was the primary caregiver for her. And um, what did that look like? You just outside of work, during work, or? Um, yeah, so I would work, I was working um, as an engineer at that point in Arizona, and I would go to work in the mornings um, and then come back early and take care of my, take care of Lana because it was too difficult for Ariel to do so for extended periods of time. And that's Lana's mother. Yeah, that's Ariel. that's Lana's mother. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Um. So your daughter will be living with you all summer. Yes. Um, is it important to you that her and Kaiden have a relationship? Yes. Do they have much of one now? No. Is would you say that's because she hasn't seen him in a while? Yes, but every time we talk, we talk daily, sometimes every other day, and we talk about Kaiden and talk about or show him or show her his pictures that I have. So we've got to wrap up pretty quickly, but have you seen, you've seen Kaiden about six hours total since October? Yes, about six or seven hours. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it's devastating. I want to have my son, and it's so hard that I haven't been allowed to see him. And why are you asking for week to week? Because I want to build a relationship with my son. And that week to week schedule would make it to where you just have to do parenting exchange once a week. Yes. Correct. And um, have you picked out, say, a doctor around you in case that's necessary. Yes. Um, how many bedrooms are in your apartment? Two. So would Kaiden have his own room? Yes. Do you have um, the necessary resources there for Kaiden? I have every resource that I would need. I have clothing. I don't have diapers right now, but I could. Those are easy to pick up. I have um, things to keep him so, from getting hurt and toys for him to play with. I've got everything I could ever need. Have you had any visitation with Kaiden that 
hasn't been court ordered? No, it has not been allowed to me. Do you have um, any, say if you need an emergency child care in Alabama, um, do you have a daycare you know of or? Yes. Yes, you picked one out? Yes. And you know Kaiden will be able to go there if yes. necessary? Ms. Hernandez mentioned that you hadn't reached out regularly over the six months um, to see Kaiden. Can you explain that? Uh, I was attempting to at the very beginning after we had separated. And at the beginning, right at right the day of we separated, she called the police. And then I had tried to contact her to have more con communication. And she kept denying. And then I had gone to the house um to pick up my car which she was withholding from me and she called the police again so there had been a history of her not wanting to work and when that did happen she would call the police and so it caused fear on my side that any interaction with her would have to be with the police involved and i can't have that within my line of work. So I stopped for fear that she was going to ruin my career. And your career brings you income, right? Yes. And you use that income to help care for your family. Yes. Okay. Last question. Um, have you ever fed Kite in a bottle? Yes, multiple are you, times. Are you confident in being able to take care of him overnight? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Anything else? Yes, just briefly. Um, Mr. Steltsy, when we calculated child support previously and the information that you provided through your attorney was your was not your gross pay, was it? It was your net pay. No, that was gross. Because again, if we if you have made twenty nine thousand two hundred ninety nine dollars and sixty eight cents through through the um, 15th day of March, which would be two and a half months, your your average gross income per month is eleven thousand seven hundred and nineteen dollars and eighty seven cents rather than the nine thousand. I don't know where you're getting that information. I get two paychecks a month and they are exactly the same at four eight eight three twenty eight. Twenty nine. Where she's getting it is from the exhibits that were introduced. There was a total pay through the March 15th paycheck of $29,040.43. And that was for a payment to you for income covering a period of two and a half months. March 15th is two and a half months. That's where she's, she's divided two and a half months into 11000 or twenty-nine thousand forty dollars and forty-three cents. Well, well I thought it was twenty-nine thousand two hundred ninety-nine sixty-eight. Well, I looked at it perhaps wrong, but the exhibits it was March fifteenth paycheck shows year today. Um, I'm sorry, it was twenty-three thousand. Twenty-nine thousand two hundred ninety-nine dollars and sixty-eight cents is the gross year-to-date income for Social Correct. Security purposes, and I divided that by two and a half to get eleven thousand seven hundred nineteen eighty-seven. I make four thousand eight hundred eighty-three twenty-eight every paycheck. And and your honor, again, I want I did want to point out that we, I don't know that we had the a thousand the thousand dollar child support on the last one, and I've run the guidelines based on the incomes that's done, and his child support should be one thousand and ninety-eight dollars. We're going to use the figures that have been introduced at this hearing, and he's entitled to credit for another he, child. What he's All right, thank you, sir. So that. That's our proof, Your Honor. You have any other proof? No, Your Honor. Oh, no, I forgot. <clears throat> I didn't add your daycare expense in. This is a temporary hearing on the establishment of a temporary parenting plan. What the court does today is basically <clears throat> just the beginning stages of what has to be done in a, in a child custody case. We have a very short uh, term marriage, so to speak, and we have a very young child child that according to the proof is still nursing with his mom, although it does take a, di uh, take a bottle 
from uh, time to time uh, if necessary. <clears throat> in, even in temporary hearings, I'm required to look to the factors that are set forth in 366106 of the Tennessee Code uh, to determine who should be the primary residential parent. <clears throat> Those factors are number one, the strength, nature, and stability of the child's relationship with each parent, whether one parent has performed the majority of parenting responsibilities relating to the daily needs of the child. I'm not assessing blame as far as the situation they found themselves in. They dated, <clears throat> she became pregnant, uh, had the child, and sometime after the child was born, they began cohabiting and then they ended up getting uh, married. But there's no question the proof has been clearly that Mrs. Hernandez or Miss Hernandez has been the primary residential parent on a temporary basis under that definition. But it doesn't mean that they don't have, he doesn't have a strong relationship with the child. It does mean that his relationship with the child has not been present, so to speak, uh, in the last few months uh, since their separation in October of 2023. <clears throat> Number two is each parent or caregiver's past potential for future performance of parental responsibilities, including the willingness and ability of each of the parents and caregivers to facilitate and encourage a, encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship. We're going to stop calling the police. Uh, there's, there's, there's no evidence before me that either of these individuals is dangerous towards the other one. Too often I see in these kinds of cases uh, that the first thing when something doesn't go the way that somebody thinks it ought to or they have a dispute, they want to call the police. When I call the police, make a police report. Police have better things to do than to have to deal with two parents who can't get along uh, and therefore want to try to make the other one look bad by making a police report. It doesn't carry any weight with me that you call the police and uh, on the day that you felt like you were threatened or whatever, I didn't hear any threats, but uh, it's not unusual for people to have disagreements. I don't get the impression that uh, Mr. Uh, Delcy is in any way, shape, form, or fashion a dangerous individual or hostile or a, t or a person who poses a threat, although I'm judging this based on what I've seen today. Likewise, it is not beneficial to you or to your case to call the police and make a police report because things didn't go on the visitation. We're going to fix that situation today. But in that regard, um, both of you need to encourage, and Ms. Hernandez, I'm probably speaking more principally to you, you need to encourage him to have a good relationship with your son. I assume you want him to have a good relationship with your son and that he needs to be a part of it. And whether you want him to be or not, he's going to have that relationship with your, with your child. And so both of you need to um, certainly encourage that. And when you have the son with you, you're going to have to encourage him to have a good relationship with his mother. And, and I'm talking long term. He's got an 18 month old. That's going to be difficult to even communicate with that child, particularly at that age. But <clears throat> whatever has happened in the past needs to be set aside. And we're going to start fresh from today. I don't have any information to indicate either of you failed to attend a parent education seminar. Both of you are going to require to, uh, be required to do that, obviously, before this divorce is final. The disposition with each parent to provide the child with food, clothing, medical care, education, or other necessary care. It is true that um, there was no court order down that required um, you to pay support for, the, your, for your son, but you knew you had a legal obligation to. You have a legal obligation for your daughter, and I admire you for, for participating in that. But the fact that you didn't contribute to the support of your son meant you were quite happy to let Mrs. Hernandez simply shoulder all of the responsibility, all of the support for this child, and that you would not have to do anything. Now, you may have been under a mistaken impression that because you didn't feel like you were getting to see the child, often enough that that meant you were relieved from the obligation legally, morally, or ethically to support your son. It is far from the truth. The law in the state of Tennessee is very clear. You have a duty to support your son from the day he's born, whether or not you're able to see your son. She has a duty and obligation to let you see the child, whether or not you're paying child support. Uh, so both of you need to set aside whatever misconceptions you've had and understand that both of those obligations, his obligation to pay child support, her obligation to allow the visitation to take place, 
a court are going to be court ordered and they're going to be enforceable by contempt. So that neither of you needs to have any misconceptions about the fact that if you're not getting to see him as often as you do, or you have a misvisitation for some reason, that you don't have to pay child support. You don't have the right to refuse to let him see his son because he's not paying child support. So let's get past that. But clearly that factor under these factors that I'm required to assess is negative against Mr. Stelsey and, and, uh, and there's no way around that. The degree to which the parent has been the primary caregiver, number five, clearly that I have found to be Ms. Hernandez. The love, affection, and emotional ties between each parent and the child. <clears throat> I, uh, I know that he has a close relationship with his daughter. This is an 18 month old. It's a little more difficult to get that uh, type of uh, bond between them. And especially when he's been in and out so much and has had little or no interactions. Uh, clearly the love and affection between Ms. Hernandez and this little boy is is there and has been built over the uh, whole span of his life. Um, the emotional needs and development level of the child, um, I don't have anything other than he's a healthy, um, thriving child, according to Ms. Hernandez. The moral, physical, and, and which speaks, of course, volumes about her care for the child, and that favors her. The moral, physical, and emotional fitness of each parent, I don't find that either of them, you know, this evidence of, if I, held it against every parent in the world who goes outside their marriage to have a relationship with another person and they could never see their child, there would be a large majority of parents, both men and women, who would never get to see their children because that is a common thing that happens in these divorce cases. So whether that did or didn't happen, I don't consider that factor to be a factor in this case. Child's interaction and interrelationship with siblings, other relatives, etc. In this particular case, the child lives in the home with Ms. Hernandez and with her three other siblings. Uh, that clearly is a favorable situation for this child. Mr. Hernandez has, I'm sorry, Mr. S uh, Stelsey has another daughter that he sees periodically. And, and when obviously he gets to see this child, hopefully we will coordinate that to where they can be together. <clears throat> the um, importance of continuity in the child's life is favors the, the mother because of the fact that it's been the stable environment that the child is there. There's no evidence of any physical or emotional abuse, uh, nor is there any evidence of any character or behavior of any other person. Uh, this child's too young to have a preference. The employment schedules of each of them are somewhat identical, although Mr. Stelsey has, uh, because he serves our country in missile defense uh, for a private contractor, he has to travel outside the country. The, continental United States, if we want to call it that, from time to time, or go to other places. I've been to White Sands, New Mexico is a beautiful place. Um, but he does have to travel. There's nothing negative about that. It just means it has to be adjusted to his visitation schedule. Um, but it does favor the Mrs. Uh, Hernandez for the fact that she has more stability in her life, um, in her work schedule. <clears throat> and um, any other factor that's deemed relevant by the court. Um, this court is of the opinion that there clearly is a preference in the legislation that's been passed by our state legislature to try to increase the participation of fathers and other non-custodial parents so that it's not so one-sided. But this is a temporary hearing and while a more, uh, that type of a, a schedule could be implemented in some cases. This is a case where Mr. Uh, Stelsey has really had very little contact with this child, even during the time that they were, since his birth, and even during the time when they were living together because of his work schedule and other things. Based on that, I do not find that it is appropriate at this point to impose a, on a temporary basis, a week on week off to a child that's had so little contact. It, in many cases where I have cases where the father or the other parent has not seen the child for extended periods, we have a graduated situation. But in this case, Mrs. Hernandez has uh, proposed, and I think it's appropriate that we set up an alternating weekend schedule where the, the child goes to visit Mr. Uh, Stelcy on the alternating weekend. We'll make that from Friday evening at 6 p.m. until Sunday at 6 p.m. on a, And again, this is temporary. And any other time that the party can agree, we're going to start communicating. He wants to communicate only with you by text message. If that's his choice, that's his choice. Uh, but 
answer the text messages if he messages you. Don't block his number. You two have to communicate. There are other parenting apps that are available for you to communicate through a parenting app, if that's more advisable. In addition to that, we have a lot of electronic things that happen. I don't get to see my grandchildren as often as I would want, but I sometimes get to FaceTime them, uh, and young children are, are not easy to FaceTime with, but just being able to see them and them see you sometimes makes a difference. He will have, under the statutory rights of a non-custodial parent, the right to telephone calls two times a month, two times a week. Well, those ought to be done in the way of a FaceTime because getting an 18-month-old on the phone is going to be virtually impossible. But if you can do something like a Zoom or a FaceTime that will allow them to see each other, then what we're looking for is not just for his benefit, Mr. Hernandez, it is for the benefit of your son to get comfortable with his father so that he can be able to spend longer periods of time with him. This is a short-term marriage. This should not require just a whole lot of preparation for trial. <clears throat> we are in the month of March uh, right now, um, and I expect that, that you ought to be able to get this case heard uh, before you're too far into the, uh, the summer. We have other court dates. I'm going to reserve the extended summer visitation issue until we see how these weekend visits go. But it's likely he's going to get extended summer visitation, especially coordinated with what his daughter from Texas does. But we may have to set something um, more definitive than just letting him pick and choose. Uh, that doesn't usually work. It may work in Texas, um, but it doesn't necessarily work here. It, I think it's going to have to have a specified time for you to have that summer visitation designated. And that way, Mr. Stelsey can work or work around, work back so that his daughter is, is there during the time he has his extended time. I want the two of them to get to know each other. They have a right to have a sister and brother in their life. Your other, just like your other children have. Um, but right now, it is this court's opinion that they need to alternate the, uh, holidays that come up. If he's going to have alternating weekends and there's a holiday, the next holiday would be Memorial Day, I assume. And let's give him Memorial Day weekend. Uh, there's no reason he can't have a three-day weekend and return him Memorial Day in the afternoon, pick up on Friday and return on uh, Monday. Okay. Give him those three days. And then beyond that, the next one would after that would be July the 4th. And we'll just reserve that because July the 4th is usually a one-day holiday unless it falls on, on a weekend. But I want to also emphasize, this is the minimum that the law requires me to give. I'm setting forth the minimum. And <clears throat> you are free to agree. And if you treat each other with kindness, like I hope you will start doing, then there's no reason the two of you can't agree that, hey, I've got a free weekend. Can I come up and see the child? This idea that you are not going to contact her because you know, the way she's behaved in the past, that's cutting off your nose to spice your own face. Contact her. If you want to see the child and you have, a, have time to do it, contact her and say, hey, I have some time. Would it be possible for me to work it out? You need to be as, as free and as liberal with that as possible. You know why? Because it's for your son's benefit, not for his necessarily. It's for allowing your son to get more comfortable before we start having longer visits and secondly, that's something that this court or whoever hears your final hearing, if it's contested, is going to look to see how the two of you have behaved towards each other. Uh, you've not done a particularly great job of interacting, and that's because things have been, the emotions have been raw, and everything has been difficult. And uh, one of our old judges, Judge Leonard Martin, used to always tell Ms. Roberts and I, when we had cases against each other, they'd tell, he'd tell our clients, going through a divorce is like... <clears throat> running naked through a briar patch. It just hurts all over, and it does. And whatever the situation has been between the two of you, whatever animosity you've developed, or whatever uh, feelings you have towards the other one that are uh, antagonistic, you need to set them aside, and you need to focus on what is important, and that is you have a child together, you chose each other to have this child together. It may not have been planned, but that doesn't matter. You have a child together. He is as much of that child's life as you are. We need to make sure that, uh, that, that he gets to have an opportunity to have that. It may not be a 50-50 split. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, 
certainly won't work if he's living in Alabama and your child's in school. <clears throat> but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So what I want you both to understand is, is that what I've done today is based on what I've heard and, and the factors that I've dealt with. It is not intended to be the final the solution or the final point of, uh, of how this case is going to go. It is designed to give you both a, pad, a plan to work with and we will calculate the child support based upon the schedule of 375 and 90, which is typical for every other weekend. We will calculate it using crediting him for the $1,000 a month he has to pay for the other child and they will credit. Uh, his income is what it is. I understand he says it's not what he makes, but the records lie, uh, the records reflect otherwise. The exhibits that I'm referring to is exhibit two to this hearing, which are copies of his payroll checks, and they are on a temporary basis going to serve as the income for him. Her income is $3,520 per month. Obviously, at a final hearing, that may change if we determine that those incomes have, have altered in some way. Do I understand both of them have insurance on this child? They do, so neither, but it doesn't cost them any additional funds right. to do that. They will cancel out. They'll neither yes. one have to have to have a credit for the uh, uh, cost of insurance. Anything I haven't addressed? No, yeah, it, I, I, I ran the numbers with her 3520 him 11720 650 for the cost of, of daycare expenses, $1,000 for her, for his child support, her having three in three in home children, him having one out of home child with $1,000, 275 and 90. His, his child support is 1,618, which is down from what we calculated. Drafted in the form as required by the law yes. and, and submit it to his attorney and let's see if there's any objections you can submit it to me and I'll make that determination. And then the only other issue is we did the issue of retroactive support that he did not pay from October forward. And that retroactive way. support is reserved for the final hearing. Clearly, as I've stated, he has a duty and obligation to pay support from the birth of the child forward from their separation until now he would owe the uh, duty of back support, but I'm not dealing with that today. Yes, sir. Um, and we, I, I would like to think they can agree on a, a place to meet to exchange and where they would do that. Um, but let's do this. <clears throat> if right you're going to have something that comes up that's going to require you to have someone else pick up your child, I don't have a problem if it's a family member that you have somebody to pick up the child instead of you having to be the one personally to pick your child up. But you said your sister lives in Virginia? Yes. If you got anybody else that's, that's family that's, that's in the area or that can assist you with picking up or delivering your child? We have uh, a friend that has been our friend since for 15 years that lives here. Well, that's I mean, fine. It's not an issue. It's just on time. The responsible adult that both of you can agree on is find the supply of transportation. There'll be times when this job requires him to not be able to be off. I mean, it's just like your airplanes. I've flown enough to know that that sometimes happens. So I'm not holding that against you, but what I am saying is, is y'all are going to have to get over this. Well, he's not here at 10 o'clock. I'm, I'm canceling the visitation. Work with him. If, it, if he says it's 1230, you had an appointment, so you couldn't hang around. That's fine. Tell him that you will let him see him later in the day or whatever. It's just, again, the visitation is not just for him. It's for your son. It's not just for you. It's for your son. So we're going to try to get you two to think about that. Um, anyway, if you two can agree on a place to meet and, a, and Friday at 6, that's, uh, you know, sometimes it might be, might be good to meet at halfway point or sometimes it, you've got three other kids. But... Try to work out some sort of a mutually agreeable place to exchange the child for both delivery and pickup that, that minimizes the time your child's uh, having to be transported. The location uh, where they designated before at the spring, the McDonald's at the spring <clears throat> we'll that. Ms. Roberts will draw the order and I'll submit it um, for approval before it comes to me. If you can't agree on the calculation of child support, both of you will submit your calculations and I'll choose. Uh, Concludes our business for today, and we are now adjourned. So. All rise.